William Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale. The wildly jealous Leontes, king of Sicilia, who, suspecting his wife Hermione of infidelity with his best friend Polixenes, embarks upon a series of actions which destine him for sorrow and the retribution of the gods. Tom Courtney is Leontes, Harriet Walter is Hermione, and Tim Pickett-Smith, Polixenes, in William Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale. Present The Winter's Tale by William Shakespeare, with Tom Courtney as Leontes, King of Sicilia, Harriet Walter as his Queen Hermione, and Tim Pigott Smith as Polixenes. The Winter's Tale. If you chance, Camillo, to visit Bohemia, on the like occasion whereon my services are now on foot, you shall see, as I have said, great difference betwixt our Bohemia and your Sicilia. I think this coming summer the King of Sicilia means to pay Bohemia the visitation which he justly owes him. Wherein our entertainment shall shame us. We will be justified in our loves, for in beseech you. Verily, I speak it in the freedom of my knowledge. We cannot, with such magnificence, in so rare... I know not what to say. We will give you sleepy drinks, that your senses unintelligent of our insufficience may, though they cannot praise us, as little accusers. You pay a great deal too dear for what's given freely. Believe me, I speak as my understanding instructs me, and as mine honesty puts it to utterance. Cecilia cannot show himself over kind to Bohemia. They were trained together in their childhoods, and there rooted betwixt them then such an affection which cannot choose but branch now. Since their more mature dignities and royal necessities made separation of their society, their encounters, though not personal, hath been royally attorneyed with interchange of gifts, letters, loving embassies, that they have seemed to be together, though absent, shook hands as over a vast, and embraced, as it were, from the ends of opposed winds. The heavens continue their loves. I think there is not in the world either malice or matter to alter it. You have an unspeakable comfort of your young Prince Mamilius. It is a gentleman of the greatest promise that ever came into my note. I very well agree with you in the hopes of him. It is a gallant child, one that indeed physics the subject, makes old hearts fresh. They that went on crutches ere he was born desire yet their life to see him a man. Would they else be content to die? Yes, if there were no other excuse why they should desire to live. If the king had no son, they would desire to live on crutches till he had one. <laughs> Nine changes of the watery star hath been the shepherd's note since we have left our throne without a burden. Time as long again would be filled up, my brother, with our thanks, and yet we should for perpetuity go hence in debt. Oh, no. And therefore, like a cipher, uh, yet standing in rich place, I multiply with one, we thank you, many thousands more that go before it. Stay yes, your thanks a while, and pay them when you pass. Sir, that's tomorrow. Oh. I am questioned by my fears of what may chance or breed upon our absence, that may blow no sneaping winds at home to make us say this is put forth too truly. Besides, <laughs> I have stayed to tire your royalty. We are tougher, brother, than you can put us to it. No longer stay. One seven night longer. Very sooth tomorrow. We'll part the time between us then, and in that I'll know again saying. Press me not, beseech you so. There is no tongue that moves, none. None in the world, so soon as yours could win me. So it should now, were the necessity in your request, although to a needful eye denied it. My affairs 
to even drag me homeward, which to hinder were in your love a whip to me, my stay, to you a charge and trouble. To save both, farewell, our brother. Tongue-tied, our queen. Speak you. I had thought, sir, to have held my peace until you had drawn oaths from him not to stay. You, sir, charge him too coldly. Tell him you're sure all in Bohemia's well. This satisfaction the bygone day proclaims. Say this to him, he's beat from his best ward. Well said, Hermione. <laughs> to tell he longs to see his son was strong, but let him say so then, and let him go. But let him swear so, and he shall not stay. We'll thwack him hence with distops. <laughs> 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 Yet of your royal presence, I'll adventure the borrow of a, a week. When at Bohemia you take my lord, I'll give him my commission to let him there a month behind the jest prefixed for his parting. Yet, good deed, Leontes, I love thee not a jar of the clock behind what lady she, our lord. You'll stay? No, madam. Nay, but you will. I may not, verily. Verily? You put me off with limber vows. <laughs> but I, though you would seek to unsphere the stars with old, should yet say, sir, no going. Verily, you shall not go. Oh. A lady's verily is as potent as a lord's. <laughs> Will you go yet? <laughs> Force me to keep you as a prisoner, not like a guest. So shall you pay your fees when you depart and save your thanks. I say you, my prisoner or my guest. Oh. By your dread, <laughs> verily, one of them you shall be. Oh, your guest, then, madam. <laughs> to be your prisoner should import offending, which is for me less easy to commit than you to punish. Not your jailer, then, but your kind hostess. Ah. Come, I'll question you of my lord's tricks and yours when you were boys. <laughs> you were pretty lordings, then. We were, fair queen, two lads that thought there was no more behind, but such a day tomorrow as today, and to be boy eternal. Was not my lord the very a wag of the two? <laughs> Now, we were as twin lambs that did frisky the sun and beat the one at the other. What we changed was innocence for innocence. We knew not a doctrine of ill-doing, nor dreamed that any did. Hmm. Had we pursued that life, and our weak spirits ne'er been higher reared with stronger blood, we should have answered heaven boldly, not guilty. The imposition cleared hereditary hours. Mm. By this we gather you have tripped since. Oh, my most sacred <laughs> lady. <laughs> temptations have since then been born to us. <laughs> In those unfledged days was my wife a girl. Your precious self had not then crossed the eyes of my young playfellow. Grace to boot. <laughs> of this make no conclusion, lest you say your queen and I are devils. <laughs> yeah, go on. The offences we have made you do, we'll answer. If you first sinned with us, and that with us you did continue fault, and that you slipped not with any but with us. <laughs> Is he one yet? He'll stay, my lord. At my request, he would not. Hermione, my dearest, thou never spokest. To better purpose. Never. Never but once. <laughs> what? Have I twice said well? <laughs> when was before? I pretty tell me. Just crams with praise and makes as fat as tame things. One good deed dying tongueless slaughters a thousand waiting upon that. Our praises are our wages. You may ride with one soft kiss a thousand furlongs, ere with spur we heat an acre. <laughs> But to the goal. My last good deed was to entreat his stay. What was my first? It has an elder sister, or I mistake you. Oh, would her name were Grace. But once before I spoke to the purpose. <laughs> when? <laughs> Nay, let me have it along. Why, that was when three crabbed months had soured themselves to death, ere I could make thee open thy white hand and clap thyself, my love. Then didst thou utter, I am yours. Forever. Uh, tis grace indeed. Why, lo you now, I have spoke to the purpose twice. The one forever earned a royal husband, the other for some while a friend. <laughs> <laughs> too hot, too hot. To mingle friendship far is mingling bloods. I have tremor cordis on me. My heart dances, but not for joy, not joy. This entertainment may a free face put on, derive a liberty from heartiness, from bounty, fertile bosom, and well become the agent, if may I grant. But to be paddling palms and pinching fingers as now they are, and making practised smiles as in a looking glass, 
and then to sigh as twere the more to the dear. Oh, that is entertainment my bosom likes not, nor my brows. Emilius, art thou my boy? Ay, my good lord. Effects, why, that's my boarcock. What, as much as thy nose? They say it is a copy out of mine. Come, Captain, we must be neat. Not neat, but cleanly, Captain. And yet the steer, the heifer, and the calf are all called neat. <laughs> Still virginaling upon his palm. How now, you wanton calf? Art thou my calf? Yes, if you will, my lord. Thou wants the rough passion, the shoots that I have to be full like me. Yet they say we are, almost as like as eggs. Women say so, that will say anything. But were they false as ore dyed blacks, as wind, as waters, false as dice are to be wished by one that fixes no born twixt his and mine. Yet were it true to say this boy were like me. Come, Sir Page, look on me with your welkin eye. Sweet villain, most dearest, my collop, can thy damn may it be. Affection, thy intention stabs the center. Thou dost make possible things not so held, communicates with dreams. How can this be? With what's unreal, thou coactive art, and fellowest nothing. Then tis very credence thou mayst conjoin with something, and thou dost, and that beyond commission, and I find it, and that's to the infection of my brains, and hardening of my brows. Mm. What means Cecilia? He something seems unsettled. How, my lord? What cheer? How is it with you, best brother? You look as if you held a brow of much distraction. Are you moved, my lord? No, in good earnest. How sometimes nature will betray its folly, its tenderness, and make itself a pastime to harder bosoms. Looking on the lines of my boy's face, methought I did recoil twenty-three years, and saw myself unbreached in my green velvet coat, <laughs> my dagger muzzled, lest it should bite its master, and so prove, as ornaments oft does. Too dangerous. How like me thought I then was to this colonel, this squash, this gentleman. <laughs> Mine honest friend, will you take eggs for money? No, my lord, I'll fight. <laughs> <laughs> you will, why, happy man, bees dough. <laughs> my brother, are you so fond of your young prince as we do seem to be of ours? If at home, sir, he's all my exercise, my mirth, my matter. Now my sworn friend, and then my enemy, my parasite, my soldier, statesman, all. <laughs> he makes a July's day short as December, and with his varying childness cures in me thoughts that would thick my blood. So stands this squire officed with me. We two will walk, my lord, and leave you to your graver steps. Hermione, how thou lovest us, show in our brother's welcome that what is dear in Sicily be cheap. Next to thyself and my young rover, he's apparent to my heart. If you would seek us, we are yours of the garden. Shall I attend you there? To your own bent dispose you. You'll be found, be you beneath the sky. <laughs> I am angling now, though you perceive me not how I give line. Go to, go to. How she holds up the neb, the bill to him and arms her with the boldness of a wife to her allowing husband. Gone already, inch thick, knee deep, or head and ears, a forked one. Go play, boy, play. Thy mother plays, and I play too. But so disgraced a part whose issue will hiss me to my grave. Contempt and clamor will be my knell. Go play, boy, play. There have been, or I am much deceived, cuckolds there now. And many a man there is, even at this present. Now, while I speak this, holds his wife by the arm. The little thinks she has been sluiced in his absence, and his pond fished by his next neighbour, by Sir Smile, his neighbour. Nay, there's comfort in't, whilst other men have gates, and those gates opened as mine, against their will. Should all despair that have revolted wives, the tenth of mankind would hang themselves. Physic for it, there's none. It is a bawdy planet that will strike where tis predominant and tis powerful, think it, from east, west, north, and south. Be it concluded, no barricado for a belly. Know it. It will let in and out the enemy with bag and baggage. Many thousands on have the disease and feel it not. 
Oh, no, boy. I'm like you, they say. Why, that's some comfort. What? Camillo there. Aye, my good lord. Go play, Mamilius. Thou art an honest man. Camillo, this great sir will yet stay longer. You had much ado to make his anchor hold. When you cast out, it still came home. It's noted. He would not stay at your petitions. Made his business more material. Didst perceive it? They're here with me already, whispering, rounding. Cecilia is a so forth. Tis far gone when I shall gust it last. How came it, Camillo, that he did stay? At the good queen's entreaty. Yeah. At the queen's, be it. Good should be pertinent, but so it is. It is not. Was this taken by any understanding pate but thine? For thy conceit is soaking, will draw in more than the common blocks. Not noted is, but of the finer natures, by some severals of headpiece extraordinary. Lower messes, perchance, are to this business purblind. Say, business, my lord? I think most understand. Bohemia stays here longer. Huh? Stays here longer. Aye, but why? To satisfy your highness. And the entreaties of our most gracious mistress. Satisfy? The entreaties of your mistress? Satisfy? Let that suffice. I have trusted thee, Camillo, with all the nearest things to my heart, as well my chamber counsels, wherein, priest-like, thou hast cleansed my bosom. I from thee departed, thy penitent reformed. But we have been deceived in thy integrity, deceived in that which seems so. Be it forbid, my lord. To bide upon it, thou art not honest, or if thou inclinest that way, thou art a coward, which hocks his honesty behind, restraining from course required, or else thou must be counted a servant, grafted in my serious trust, and therein negligent, or else a fool that sees a game played home, the rich stake drawn, and takes it all for jest. My gracious lord, I may be negligent, foolish, and fearful. In every one of these no man is free, but that his negligence, his folly, fear, among the infinite doings of the world, sometime puts forth. In your affairs, my lord, if ever I were willful negligent, it was my folly. If industriously I played the fool, it was my negligence not weighing well the end. If ever fearful to do a thing where I the issue doubted, whereof the execution did cry out against the non-performance, it was a fear which oft infects the wisest. These, my lord, are such allowed infirmities that honesty is never free of, but beseech your grace. Be plainer with me. Let me know my trespass by its own visage. If I then deny it, it is none of mine. Are you not seen, Camillo? But that's past doubt you have, or your eyeglass is thicker than a cuckold's horn. Or heard, for to a vision so apparent, rumour cannot be mute. Or thought, for cogitation resides not in that man that does not think. My wife is slippery. If thou wilt confess... Or else be impudently negative, to have no eyes, no ears, nor thought, then say, my wife's a hobby horse. Deserves a name as rank as any flax wench that puts to before her troth plight. Say it and justify it. I would not be a stander-by to hear my sovereign mistress clouded so without my present vengeance taken. Show my heart, you never spoke what did become you less than this which, to reiterate, was sin as deep as that, though true. He's whispering nothing. He's leaning cheek to cheek, he's meeting noses, kissing with inside lip, stopping the career of laughter with a sigh, a note infallible of breaking honesty, horsing foot on foot, skulking in corners, which in clocks more swift, hours, minutes, noon, midnight, and all eyes blind with the pin and web, but theirs, theirs only, that would, unseen, be wicked. Is this nothing? Why, well, then the world and all the tint is nothing. The covering sky is nothing. Bohemia, nothing. My wife is nothing, nor nothing have these nothings, if this be nothing. Good my lord, be cured of this diseased opinion, and betimes, for it is most dangerous. I say it be, it is true. No, no, my lord. It is, you lie, you lie. I say thou liest, Camillo, and I hate thee. Pronounce thee a gross lout. A mindless slave, or else a hovering temporizer, that canst with thine eyes at once see good and evil, inclining to them both. Where my wife's liver, infected as her life, 
she would not live the running of one glass. Who does infect her? Why, he that wears her like a medal hanging about his neck. Bohemia. Who, if I had servants true about me, that bear eyes to see alike mine honour as their profits, their own particular thrifts, they would do that which should undo more doing. Aye, and now, his cupbearer, whom I from meaner form have benched and reared to worship, who may see plainly as heaven sees earth and earth sees heaven how I am galled, might bespice a cup to give mine enemy a lasting wink, which draught to me were cordial. Sir. My lord, I could do this, and that with no rash potion, but with a lingering dram that should not work maliciously like poison. But I cannot believe this crack to be in my dread mistress, so sovereignly being honourable. I have loved thee. Make that thy question and go rot. Dost think I am so muddy, so unsettled, to appoint myself in this vexation? Sully the purity and whiteness of my sheets, which to preserve is sleep, which being spotted is goads, thorns, nettles, tails of wasps, give scandal to the blood of the prince, my son, who I do think is mine, and love as mine, without ripe moving to it. Would I do this? Could man so blench? I must believe you, sir. I do, and will fetch off Bohemia Fort. Provided that when he's removed, your highness will take again your queen as yours at first, even for your son's sake, and thereby foreseeing the injury of tongues in courts and kingdoms known and allied to yours. Thou dost advise me, even so as I mine own course have set down. I'll give no blemish to her honour. None, my lord. Go then, and with a countenance as clear as friendship wears at feasts, keep with Bohemia and with your queen. I am his cupbearer. If from me he have wholesome beverage, account me not your servant. This is all. Do it, and thou hast the one half of my heart. Do it not. Thou splits thine own. I'll do it, my lord. I will seem friendly, as thou hast advised me. O oh, miserable lady... But for me, what case stand I in? I must be the poisoner of good Polixenes, and my ground to do it is the obedience to a master, one who in rebellion with himself will have all that are his so too. To do this deed, promotion follows. If I could find example of thousands that had struck anointed kings and flourished after, I'd not do to but since nor brass, nor stone, nor parchment bears not one, let villainy itself forswear it. I must forsake the court. To do it or no is certain to me a breakneck. Happy star, reign now. Here comes Bohemia. This is strange. Methinks my favour here begins to warp, not speak. Good day, Camillo. Hail, most royal sir. What is the news of the court? None rare, my lord. The king hath on him such a countenance as he had lost some province and a region loved as he loves himself. Even now I met him with customary compliment when he, wafting his eyes to the contrary and falling a lip of much contempt, speeds from me and so leaves me to consider what is breeding that changes thus his manners. I dare not know, my lord. Do not. No, and dare not be intelligent to me. Tis thereabouts, for to yourself what you do know, you must and cannot say you dare not. Good Camillo, your changed complexions are to me a mirror which shows me mine changed too. For I must be a party in this alteration, finding myself thus altered with. There is a sickness which puts some of us in distemper, but I cannot name the disease. And it is court of you that yet are well. How? Court of me? Make me not sighted like the basilisk. I have looked on thousands who have sped the better by my regard, but killed none so. Camillo, 
If you know aught which does behove my knowledge thereof to be informed, imprisoned not in ignorant concealment. I may not answer. <laughs> A sickness caught of me, and yet I well. I must be answered. Dost thou hear, Camillo? I conjure thee by all the parts of man which honour does acknowledge, whereof the least is not the suit of mine, that thou declare what incidency thou dost guess of harm is creeping towards me. How far off, how near, which way to be prevented if to be, if not, how best to bear it. Sir, I will tell you, since I am charged in honour, and by him that I think honourable. Therefore mark my counsel which must be even as swiftly followed as I mean to utter it, or both yourself and me cry lost. And so good night. Home, oh, good Camillo. I am appointed him to murder you. By whom, Camillo? By the king. For what? He thinks, nay, with all confidence, he swears, as he had seen to have been an instrument to vice you to it, that you have touched his queen forbiddenly. Then my best blood turn to an infected jelly and my name be yoked with his that did betray the best turn then my freshest reputation to a savour that may strike the dullest nostril where i arrive and my approach be shunned nay hated too worse than the greatest infection that e'er was heard or read swear his thought over by each particular star in heaven and by all their influences you may as well forbid the sea for to obey the moon, as or by oath remove or counsel shake the fabric of his folly, whose foundation is piled upon his faith and will continue the standing of his body. How should this grow? I know not, but I'm sure it is safer to avoid what's grown than question how it is born. If, therefore, you dare trust my honesty that lies enclosed in this trunk, which you shall bear along impawned, away tonight. Your followers I will whisper to the business and will by twos and threes at several posterns clear them of the city. For myself, I'll put my fortunes to your service, which are here by this discovery lost. Be not uncertain, for by the honour of my parents I have uttered truth, which if you seek to prove, I dare not stand by, nor shall you be safer than one condemned by the king's own mouth, thereon his execution sworn. I do believe thee. I saw his heart in his face. Give me thy hand. Be pilot to me, and thy places shall still neighbour mine. My ships are ready, and my people did expect my hence departure two days ago. This jealousy is for a precious creature. As she's rare, must it be great. And as his person's mighty, must it be violent? And as he does conceive he is dishonoured by a man which ever professed to him, why, his revenges must in that be made more bitter. Fear or shades me. Good expedition be my friend, and comfort the gracious queen. Part of his theme, but nothing of his ill-tained suspicion. Come, Camillo, I will respect thee as a father if thou bearest my life off. Hence, let us avoid. It is in mine authority to command the keys of all the posterns. Please, your highness, to take the urgent hour. Come, sir, away. So troubles me, it is past enduring. Come, my gracious lord, shall I be your playfellow? No, I'll none of you. Why, my sweet lord? You'll kiss me hard and speak to me as if I were a baby still. Oh. I love you better. Oh, and why so, my lord? Not for because your brows are blacker, yet black brows, they say, become some women and best, <laughs> so that there be not too much hair there, but in a semicircle. <laughs> Or a half moon made with a pen. <laughs> Who taught this? I learnt it out of women's faces. Pray now, what colour are your eyebrows? Mm, blue, my lord. 
Nay, that's a mock. <laughs> I have seen a lady's nose that has been blue, but not her eyebrows. <laughs> Hark ye, the queen your mother rounds apace. We shall present our services to a fine new prince one of these days, and then you'd wanton with us if we would have you. She is spread of late into a goodly bulk. Mm -hmm. Good time encounter her. What wisdom stirs amongst you? Oh, Come, sir, now I'm for you again. Pray you sit by us and tell the tale. Merry or sad shall be. As merry as you will. A sad tale's best for winter. I have one of sprites and goblins. Let's have that, good sir. Come on, sit down. Come on and do your best to fright me with your sprites. You're powerful at it. There was a man. Nay, come sit down. Then on. Dwelt by a churchyard. I will tell it softly. <laughs> Young cricket shall not hear it. <laughs> come on then and give me in my ear. <laughs> Was he met there? This train, Camillo with him. Behind the tuft of pines, I met them. Never saw I men scour so on their way. I eyed them even to their ships. How blessed am I in my just censure, in my true opinion. A lack for lesser knowledge, how accursed in being so blessed. There may be in the cup a spider steeped, and one may drink, depart, and yet partake no venom, for his knowledge is not infected. But if one present the abhorred ingredients to his eye, make known how he hath drunk, he cracks his gorge, his sides, with violent hefts. I have drunk and seen the spider. Camillo was his help in this, his panda. There is a plot against my life, my crown. All's true, that is mistrusted. That false villain whom I employed was pre-employed by him. He has discovered my design, and I remain a pinch thing. Yea, a very trick for them to play at will. How came the postern so easily open? By his great authority, which often hath no less prevail than so on your command. I know it's too well. Give me the boy. What? I'm glad you did not nurse him, though he does bear some signs of me. Yet you have too much blood in him. What is this? Sport? Bear the boy hence. He shall not come about her. Away with him and let her sport herself with that she is big with. For tis Polixenes has made thee swell thus. But I'd say he had not. And I'll be sworn you would believe my saying howe'er you lean to the naywood. You, my lords, look on her. Mark her well. Be but about to say she is a goodly lady, and the justice of your hearts will thereto add. Tis pity she's not honest, honourable. Praise her, but for this her without door form, which on my faith deserves high speech, and straight the shrug, the hm or ah, these petty brands that calumny doth use, oh, I am out, that mercy does, for calumny will see a virtue itself. These shrugs, these ums and ahs, when you have said she's goodly, come between, ere you can say she's honest. But be it known from him that has most cause to grieve, it should be. She's an adulteress. Should a villain say so? The most replenished villain in the world, he were as much more villain. You, my lord, do but mistake. You have mistook, my lady. Polixenes, Foleontes. I have said she's an adulteress. I have said with whom? More, she's a traitor. And Camillo is a federy with her. And one that knows what she should shame to know herself, but with her most vile principle, that she's a bed swerver, even as bad as those that vulgars give bold titles. I am privy to this their late escape. No, by my life, privy to none of this. How will this grieve you when you shall come to clearer knowledge that you thus have published me? Gentle my lord, you scarce can write me truly then to say you did mistake. No. If I mistake in those foundations which I build upon, the centre is not big enough to bear a schoolboy's top. Away with her to prison. What? He who shall speak for her is a far-off guilty, but that he speaks. There's some ill planet reigns. I must be patient till the heavens look with an aspect more favourable. Good, my lords, I am not prone to weeping as our sex commonly are. The want of which vain dew perchance shall dry your pities. But I have that honourable grief lodged here, which burns 
Worse than tears drown. I beseech you all, my lords, with thoughts so qualified as your charity shall best instruct you, measure me. And so, the king's will be performed. Shall I be heard? Who is that goes with me? Beseech your highness, my women may be with me, for you see, my plight requires it. Do not weep, good fools, there is no cause. When you shall know your mistress has deserved prison, then abound in tears when I come out. This action I now go on is for my better grace. Adieu, my lord. I never wished to see you sorry. Now I trust I shall. My women, come. You have leave. Go to our bidding. Hence. Beseech your highness, call the queen again. Be certain what you do, sir. Lest your justice prove violence in the which three great ones suffer. Yourself, your queen, your son. For her, my lord, I dare my life lay down and will do it, sir. Please you to accept it. That the queen is spotless in the eyes of heaven and to you. I mean in this which you accuse her. Well, if it proves she's otherwise... I'll keep my stables where I lodge my wife. I'll go in couples with her. Then when I feel and see her, no father trust her. For every inch of woman in the world, I every dram of woman's flesh is false, if she be. Hold your pieces. Good, my lord. It is for you we speak, not for ourselves. You are abused, and by some putter on that will be damned for it. What I knew, the villain, I would lamb damn him. Be she honour flawed. I have three daughters. The eldest is eleven, the second and the third, nine and some five. If this prove true, they'll pay for it. By mine honour, I'll geld them all. Fourteen they shall not see to bring false generations. They are co-heirs, and I had rather glib myself than they should not produce fair issue. Cease, no more. You smell this business with a sense as cold as is a dead man's nose, but I do see it and feel it. As you feel doing thus, and see with all the instruments that fail. If it be so, we need no grave to bury honesty. There's not a grain of it, the face to sweeten of the whole dungy earth. What, like I credit? I had rather you did lack than I, my lord, upon this ground. And more it would content me to have her honour true than your suspicion. Be blamed for it how you might. Why, what need we commune with you of this? but rather follow our forceful instigation. Our prerogative calls not your counsels, but our natural goodness imparts this, which if you, or stupefied or seeming so in skill, cannot or will not relish a truth like us. Inform yourselves. We need no more of your advice. The matter, the loss, the gain, the ordering on't is all properly ours. And I wish, my liege, you had only in your silent judgment tried it without more overture. How could that be? Either thou art most ignorant by age, or thou wert born a fool. Camillo's flight, added to their familiarity, doth push on this proceeding. Yet, for greater confirmation, for in an act of this importance twere most piteous to be wild, I have dispatched in post to sacred Delphos, to Apollo's temple, Cleomenes and Dion, whom you know of stuffed sufficiency. Now from the oracle they will bring all, whose spiritual counsel had shall stop or spur me. Have I done well? Well done, my lord. Though I am satisfied and need no more than what I know, Yet shall the oracle give rest to the minds of others, such as he, whose ignorant credulity will not come up to the truth. So have we thought it good from our free person she should be confined, lest that the treachery of the two fled hence be left her to perform. Come, follow us. We are to speak in public, for this business will raise us all. To laughter, as I take it, if the good truth were known.
My Lady Paulina. The keeper of the prison. Call to him. Let him have knowledge who I am. Good lady, no court in Europe is too good for thee. What dost thou then in prison? Mm. Now, good sir, you know me, do you not? For a worthy lady, and one who much I honour. Pray you then conduct me to the Queen. I may not, madam. To the contrary, I have express commandment. Here's a doom to lock up honesty and honour from the access of gentle visitors. Is lawful, pray you, to see her women, any of them. Emilia? Uh, so please you, madam, to put apart these, your attendants, I shall bring Emilia forth. I pray now, call her. Withdraw yourselves. Uh, and, madam, I must be present at your conference. Well, be it so, pretty. Here's such a do to make no stain a stain as passes colouring. Dear gentlewoman, how fares our gracious lady? As well as one so great and so forlorn may hold together. On her frights and griefs, which never tender lady hath borne greater, she is something before her time delivered. A boy? A daughter, and a goodly babe, lusty and like to live. Ah. The queen receives much comfort in't, says, My poor prisoner, I am innocent as you. I dare be sworn. These dangerous, unsafe loons in the king beshrew them. He must be told on't, and he shall. The office becomes a woman best, I'll take it upon me. If I prove honey-mouthed, let my tongue blister and never to my red-looked anger be the trumpet any more. Pray you, Emilia, commend my best obedience to the Queen. If she dares trust me with her little babe, I'll show it the King and undertake to be her advocate to the loudest. We do not know how he may soften at the sight of the child. The silence often of pure innocence persuades when speaking fails. Most worthy madam, your honour and your goodness is so evident that your free undertaking cannot miss a thriving issue. There is no lady living so meet for this great errand. Please, your ladyship, to visit the next room. I'll presently acquaint the queen of your most noble offer, who but today hammered of this design, but durst not tempt a minister of honour, lest she should be denied. Tell her, Emilia, I'll use that tongue I have. If wit flow from it as boldness from my bosom, let it not be doubted, I shall do good. Now be you blessed for it. I'll to the Queen. Please you, come something nearer. I, I, ma madam, if please the Queen to send the babe, I know not what I shall incur to pass it, having no warrant. You need not fear it, sir. This child was prisoner to the womb, and is by law and process of great nature, thence freed and enfranchised, not a party to the anger of the king, nor guilty of, if any be, the trespass of the queen. I do believe it. Do not you fear. Upon mine honour, I will stand betwixt you and danger. No night, no day, no rest. It is but weakness to bear the matter thus. Mere weakness. If... The cause were not in being. Part of the cause, she the adulteress. For the harlot king is quite beyond mine arm. Out of the blank and level of my brain. Plot proof. But she, I can hook to me. Say that she were gone, given to the fire. A moiety of my rest might come again. Who's there? My lord. How does the boy? He took good rest tonight. Tis hoped his sickness is discharged. To see his nobleness. Conceiving the dishonour of his mother, he straight declined, drooped, took it deeply. Fastened and fixed the shame on in himself, threw off his spirit, his appetite, his sleep, and downright languished. L leave me solely. Go see how he fares. Fie, fie, no thought of him. The very thought of my revenges that way recoil upon me, in himself too mighty, and in his parties his alliance. Let him be, until a time may serve. For present vengeance, take it on her. Camillo and Polixenes laugh at me, make their pastime at my sorrow. They should not laugh if I could reach them, nor shall she within my power.
must not enter. Nay, rather, my good lords, be second to me. Fear you his tyrannous passion more and last than the Queen's life? A gracious, innocent soul more free than he is jealous? That's enough, madam. He hath not slept tonight. Commanded none should come at him. Not so hot, good sir. I come to bring him sleep. It is such as you that creep like shadows by him and do sigh at each his needless heavings. Such as you nourish the cause of his awaking. I do come with words as medicinal as true, honest as either, to purge him of that humour that presses him from sleep. What noise there? Oh. No noise, my lord, but needful conference about some gossips for your highness. How away with that audacious lady. Antigonus, I charge thee that she should not come about me. I knew she would. I told her so, my lord, on your displeasure's pedal and on mine she should not visit you. What, canst not rule her? From all dishonesty he can. In this, unless he take the course that you have done, commit me for committing honour, trust it, he shall not rule me. Lie you now, you hear. When she will take the rein, I let her run, but she'll not stumble. Good, my liege, I come and I beseech you hear me, who profess myself your loyal servant, your physician, your most obedient counsellor, yet that dares less appear so in comforting your evils than such as most seem yours, I say, I come from your good queen. Good queen? Good queen, my lord. Good queen, I say, good queen. And would by combat make her good, so were I a man, the worst about you. Force her hence. Let him that make but trifles of his eyes first hand me. On mine own accord I'll off, but first I'll do my errand. The good queen, for she is good, hath brought you forth a daughter, here it is, Commends it to your blessing. Out, a mankind witch! Hence with her, out a door, a most intelligencing bore. Not so. I am as ignorant in that as you in so entitling me, and no less honest than you are mad, which is enough, I'll warrant, as this world goes to pass for honest. Traitors, will you not push her out? Give her the bastard. Thou dotard, thou art woman tired, unroosted by thy dame partlet here. Take up the bastard. Take it up, I say. Give it to thy crow. Forever unvenerable be thy hands if thou takest up the princess by that forced baseness which he has put upon it. He dreads his wife. So I would you did. Then to past all doubt you'd call your children yours. A nest of traitors. I am none by this good light. Nor I, nor any but one that's here, and that's himself. For he, the sacred honour of himself, his queens, his hopeful sons, his babes, betrays to slander whose sting is sharper than the swords, and will not, for as the case now stands, it is a curse, he cannot be compelled to it, once remove the root of his opinion, which is rotten, as ever oak or stone was sound. A callot of boundless tongue, who late hath beat her husband, and now baits me. This brat is none of mine. It is the issue of Polixenes. Hence with it, and together with the dam, commit them to the fire. It is yours! And might we lay the old proverb to your charge, so like you, tis the worse. Behold, my lords, although the print be little, the whole matter and copy of the father, eye, nose, lip, the trick of his frown, his forehead, nay, the valley, the pretty dimples of his chin and cheek, his smiles, the very mould and frame of hand, nail, finger, and thou, good goddess nature, which hast made it so like him that got it. If thou hast the ordering of the mind, too, amongst all colours no yellow in it, lest she suspect, as he does, her children, not her husband's. A gross hag! And, Lozo, thou art worthy to be hanged, that will not stay her tongue. Hang all the husbands that cannot do that feat, you'll leave yourself hardly one subject. Once more, take her hence. A most unworthy and unnatural lord can do no more. I'll have ye burned! <laughs> I care not. It is an heretic that makes the fire, not she which burns in it. I'll not call you tyrant. But this most cruel usage of your queen, not able to produce more accusation than your own weak hinged fancy, something savours of tyranny, and will ignoble make you, yea, scandalous to the world. On your allegiance, out of the chamber with her, were I a tyrant, where were her life? She durst not call me so if she did know me one. Away with her. I pray you do not push me. I'll be gone. Look to your babe, my lord. Tis yours. Jove sent her a better guiding spirit. What needs these hands? You 
that are thus so tender are his follies will never do him good. Not one of you. So, so, farewell. We are gone. Thou, traitor, hast set on thy wife to this. My child, away with it. Even thou, that hast a heart so tender o'er it, take it hence and see it instantly consumed with fire. Even thou, and none but thou, take it up straight. Within this hour bring me word tis done, and by good testimony, or I'll seize thy life with what thou else call'st thine. If thou refuse, and wilt encounter with my wrath, say so. The bastard brains with these my proper hands shall I dash out. Go, take it to the fire, for thou setst on thy wife. I did not, sir. These lords, my noble fellows, if they please, can clear me. And... We can. My royal liege, he is not guilty of her coming hither. Your liars all. Beseech your highness, give us better credit. We have always truly served you, and beseech so to esteem of us. And on our knees we beg, as recompense of our dear services, past and to come, that you do change this purpose, which being so horrible, so bloody, must lead on to some foul issue. We all kneel. I am a feather for each wind that blows. Shall I live on to see this bastard kneel and call me father? Better burn it now than curse it then. But be it. Let it live. It shall not neither. You, sir, come you hither. You that have been so tenderly officious with Lady Marjorie, your midwife there, to save this bastard's life, for tis a bastard as sure as your beard's grey. What will you adventure to save this brat's life? Anything, my lord, that my ability may undergo and nobleness impose. At least thus much. I'll pawn the little blood which I have left to save the innocent. Anything possible. It shall be possible. Swear by this sword thou wilt perform my bidding. I will, my lord. Mark and perform it, seest thou. For the fail of any point in shall not only be death to thyself, but to thy lewd-tongued wife, whom for this time we pardon. We enjoin thee, as thou art liege man to us, that thou carry this female bastard hence, and that thou bear it to some remote and desert place, quite out of our dominions, and that there thou leave it, without more mercy to its own protection and favour of the climate. As by strange fortune it came to us, I do in justice charge thee on thy soul's peril and thy body's torture, that thou commend it strangely to some place where chance may nurse or end it. Take it up. I swear to do this, though a present death had been more merciful. Come on, poor babe. Some powerful spirit instruct the kites and ravens to be thy nurses. Wolves and bears, they say, casting their savageness aside, have done like offices of pity. Sir, be prosperous in more than this deed does require. And blessing against this cruelty fight on thy side, poor thing, condemned to loss. No, I'll not rear another's issue. Please, Your Highness, posts from those you sent to the Oracle are come an hour since. Cleomenes and Dion, being well arrived from Delphos, are both landed. Hasting to the court. So please you, sir, their speed hath been beyond a compt. Twenty-three days they have been absent, tis good speed. Foretells the great Apollo suddenly will have the truth of this appear. Prepare you, lords, summon a session, that we may arraign our most disloyal lady. For as she hath been publicly accused, so shall she have a just and open trial. While she lives, my heart will be a burden to me. Leave me, and think upon my bidding. The 
climate's delicate, the air most sweet, fertile the isle, the temple much surpassing the common praise it bears. Yeah, I shall report, for most it caught me, the celestial habits, methinks I so should term them, and the reverence of the grave wearers. Oh, the sacrifice. How ceremonious, solemn, and unearthly it was at the offering. But of all the burst and the ear-deafening voice of the oracle, kin to Jove's thunder, so surprised my sense that I was nothing. If the event of the journey prove as successful to the queen, oh, be it so, as it hath been to us, rare, pleasant, speedy, the time is worth the use on't. Great Apollo, turn all to the best. Are these proclamations so forcing faults upon Hermione I little like? The violent carriage of it will clear or end the business. When the oracle, thus by Apollo's great divine sealed up, shall the contents discover, something rare, even then, will rush to knowledge. Go. Fresh horses. And gracious be the issue. This session, to our great grief we pronounce, even pushes against our heart. The party tried, the daughter of a king, our wife, and one of us too much beloved. Let us be cleared of being tyrannous, since we so openly proceed in justice, which shall have due course even to the guilt or the purgation. Produce the prisoner. It is his highness' pleasure that the queen appear in person here in court. Silence. Read the indictment. Hermione, queen to the worthy Leontes, king of Sicilia, thou art here accused and arraigned of high treason in committing adultery with Polixenes, king of Bohemia, and conspiring with Camillo to take away the life of our sovereign lord, the king, thy royal husband. The pretense whereof being, by circumstances partly laid open, thou, Hermione, Contrary to the faith and allegiance of a true subject, didst counsel and aid them for their better safety to fly away by night. Since what I am to say must be but that which contradicts my accusation, and the testimony on my part no other but what comes from myself, it shall scarce boot me to say not guilty. Mine integrity being counted falsehood, shall, as I express it, be so received. But thus, if powers divine behold our human actions as they do, I doubt not then, but innocence shall make false accusation blush, and tyranny tremble at patience. You, my lord, Best know, who least will seem to do so, my past life hath been as continent, as chaste, as true as I am now unhappy, which is more than history can pattern, though devised and played to take spectators. For behold me, a fellow of the royal bed, which owe a moiety of the throne, a great king's daughter, the mother to our hopeful prince, here standing to prate and talk for life and honour for who please to come and hear. For life I prize it as I weigh grief, which I would spare. For honour, it is a derivative from me to mine, and only that I stand for. I appeal to your own conscience, sir, before Polixenes came to your court, how I was in your grace, how merited to be so, since he came. With what encounter so uncurrent I have strained to appear thus. If one jot beyond the bound of honour, or in act or will that way inclining, hardened be the hearts of all that hear me, and my nearest of kin cry fie upon my grave. I ne'er heard yet that any of these bolder vices wanted less impudence to gainsay what they did, 
than to perform it first. That's true enough, though tis a saying, sir, not due to me. You will not own it. More than mistress of which comes to me in name of fault, I must not at all acknowledge. For Polixenes, with whom I am accused, I do confess I loved him, as in honour he required. With such a kind of love as might become a lady like me. With a love even such, so, and no other, as yourself commanded which not to have done, I think, had been in me both disobedience and ingratitude to you and toward your friend, whose love had spoke, even since it could speak, from an infant, freely that it was yours. Now, for conspiracy, I know not how it tastes, though it be dished for me to try how. All I know of it is that Camillo was an honest man, and why he left your court, the gods themselves, wotting no more than I, are ignorant. You knew of his departure, as you know what you have undertaken to do in Zabson. Sir, you speak a language that I understand not. My life stands in the level of your dreams, which I'll lay down. Your actions are my dreams. You had a bastard by Polixenes, and I but dreamt it. As you were past all shame, those of your fact are so, so past all truth, which to deny concerns more than avails. For as thy brat hath been cast out, like to itself no father owning it, which is indeed more criminal in thee than it, so thou shalt feel our justice, in whose easiest passage look for no less than death. Oh, sir, spare your threats. The bug which you would frighten me with, I seek. To me can life be no commodity. The crown and comfort of my life, your favour I do give lost, for I do feel it gone, though know not how it went. My second joy and first fruits of my body, from his presence I am barred like one infectious. My third comfort, starred most unluckily, is from my breast. The innocent milk in its most innocent mouth hailed out to murder. Myself on every post proclaimed a strumpet. With immodest hatred, the childbed privilege denied, which longs to women of all fashion. Lastly, hurried here to this place in the open air before I have got strength of limit. Now, my leech. <laughs> Tell me what blessings I have here alive that I should fear to die. Therefore proceed. But yet, hear this. Mistake me not. No, life, I prize it not a straw. But for mine honour, which I would free, if I shall be condemned upon surmises, all proof sleeping else but what your jealousies awake, I tell you, tis rigour and not law. Your honours all, I do refer me to the oracle. Apollo be my judge. This your request is altogether just. Therefore bring forth, and in Apollo's name, his oracle. The emperor of Russia was my father. <laughs> that he were alive and here beholding his daughter's trial, that he did but see the flatness of my misery, yet with eyes of pity, not revenge. You here shall swear upon this sword of justice that you, Cleomenes and Dion, have been both at Delphos and from thence have brought this sealed up oracle by the hand delivered of great Apollo's priest, and that since then you have not dared to break the holy seal nor read the secrets in it, all, All this, this we swear. swear. Break up the seals and read. Hermione is chaste, <gasps> Polixenes oh. blameless, Camillo a true subject, Leontes a jealous tyrant, 
his innocent babe truly begotten. Oh. And the king shall live without an heir if that which is lost be not found. Now, blessed be the great Apollo. <gasps> Praise. Hast <laughs> thou read truth? Aye, my lord, even so, as it is here set down. <laughs> There is no truth at all in the oracle. The session shall proceed. This is mere falsehood. My lord, the king, the king. What is the business? Sir, I shall be hated to report it. The prince, your son, with mere conceit and fear of the queen's speed, is gone. How oh, gone? Is dead. <gasps> Apollo's angry, and the heavens themselves do strike at my injustice. Oh! How now there? This news is mortal to the Queen. Look down and see what death is doing. D -d Take her hence. Her heart is but or charged. She will recover. I have too much believed mine own suspicion. But beseech you, tenderly apply to her some remedies for life. Apollo, pardon my great profaneness against thine oracle. I'll reconcile me to Polixenes. New woo my Queen. Recall the good Camillo, whom I proclaim a man of truth, of mercy. For being transported by my jealousies to bloody thoughts and to revenge, I chose Camillo for the minister to poison my friend Polixenes, which had been done, but that the good mind of Camillo tardied my swift command. How he glisters through my rust and how his piety does my deeds make the blacker. Woe the while! Oh, cut my lace, lest my heart, cracking it, break too. What fit is this, good lady? What studied torments tyrant has for me? What wheels, racks, fires? What flaying, boiling in leads or oils? What old or newer torture must I receive, whose every word deserves to taste of thy most worst? Thy tyranny, together working with thy jealousies, fancies too weak for boys, too green and idle for girls of nine. Oh, think what they have done and then run mad indeed, stark mad, for all thy bygone fooleries were but spices of it. That thou betrayedst Polixenes, t'was nothing. That did but show thee of a fool inconstant and damnable ingrateful. Nor wast much thou wouldst have poisoned good Camillo's honour to have him kill a king. Poor trespasses, more monstrous standing by, whereof I reckon the casting forth to crows thy baby daughter to be or none or little, though a devil would have shed water out of fire ere done it. Nor is directly laid to thee the death of the young prince, whose honourable thoughts, thoughts high for one so tender, cleft the heart that could conceive a gross and foolish sire blemished his gracious dam. This is not, no, laid to thy answer, but the last. O oh, lords, when I have said cry woe, the queen, the queen, the sweetest, dearest creature's dead. And vengeance for it not dropped down yet. The higher powers forbid. I say she's dead. I'll swear it. If word or oath prevail not, go and see. If you can bring tincture or lustre in her lip, her eye, heat outwardly or breath within, I'll serve you as I would do the gods. But, oh, thou tyrant, do not repent these things for they are heavier than all thy woes can stir. Therefore betake thee to nothing but despair. A thousand knees, ten thousand years together, naked, fasting upon a barren mountain, and still winter in storm perpetual, could not move the gods to look that way thou wert. Go on, go on. Thou canst not speak too much. I have deserved all tongues to talk their bitterest. Say no more. However business goes, you have made fault in the boldness of your speech. I am sorry for it. All faults I make, when I shall come to know them, I do repent. Alas, I have showed too much the rashness of a woman. He is touched to the noble heart. What's gone and what's past help should be past grief. Do not receive affliction at my petition, I beseech you. Rather let me be punished 
that have minded you of what you should forget. Now, good my liege, sir, royal sir, forgive a foolish woman. The love I bore your queen, no fool again. I'll speak of her no more, nor of your children. I'll not remember you of my own lord, who is lost too. Take your patience to you, and I'll say nothing. Thou didst speak but well when most the truth, which I received much better than to be pitied of thee. Prithee bring me to the dead bodies of my queen and son. One grave shall be for both. Upon them shall the causes of their death appear, unto our shame perpetual. Once a day I'll visit the chapel where they lie, and tears shed there shall be my recreation, so long as nature will bear up with this exercise, so long I daily vow to use it. Come, and lead me to these sorrows. Thou art perfect, then. Our ship hath touched upon the deserts of Bohemia. Aye, my lord. I fear we have landed in ill time. The skies look grimly and threaten present blusters. In my conscience, the heavens with that we have in hand are angry and frown upon us. Their sacred wills be done. Go, get aboard, look to thy bark. I'll not be long before I call upon thee. Make your best haste, and go not too far in the land. Tis like to be loud weather. Besides, this place is famous for the creatures of prey that keep upon it. Go thou away. I'll follow instantly. I'm glad at heart to be so rid of business. Come, poor babe. I have heard, but not believed. The spirits of the dead may walk again. If such things be, thy mother appeared to me last night, for ne'er was dream so like a waking. To me comes a creature, sometimes a head on one side, some another. I never saw a vessel of like sorrow, so filled and so becoming. In pure white robes, like very sanctity, she did approach my cabin, where I lay. Thrice bowed before me, and gasping to begin some speech, her eyes became two spouts. The fury spent, anon did this break from her, called Antigonus. Since fate against thy better disposition hath made thy person for the thrower out of my poor babe, according to thy oath, places remote enough are in Bohemia. There weep and leave it crying, and for the babe is counted lost forever. Perdita. I prithee called. For this ungentle business put on thee by my lord, thou ne'er shalt see thy wife, Paulina, more. And so with shrieks she melted into air. Affrighted much, I did in time collect myself and thought, this was so and no slumber. <laughs> Dreams are toys. Yet for this once, Yea, superstitiously, I will be squared by this. I do believe Hermione hath suffered death, and that Apollo would, this being indeed the issue of King Polixenes, it should here be laid, either for life or death upon the earth of its right father. <sighs> Blossom, speed thee well. <sighs> there lie... <sighs> There thy character. There these, which may, if fortune please, both breed thee pretty and still rest thine. The storm begins. Poor wretch that for thy mother's fault art thus exposed to loss and what may follow. Weep, I cannot, but my heart bleeds. And most accursed am I to be by oath enjoined to this. Farewell. The day frowns more and more. I'd like to have a lullaby too rough. I never saw the heavens so dim by day. A savage clamor. 
vehicle may I get aboard? Oh, this is the chase! I am gone forever. I would there were no edge between ten and three and twenty. Oh, that youth would sleep out the rest. But there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancientry, stealing, fighting. Hark you now, would any but these boiled brains of nineteen and two and twenty on this weather? They have scared away two of my best sheep, which I fear the wolf will sooner find than the master. If anywhere I have them, tis by the seaside, browsing of ivy. Good luck, and be thy will. What have we? Mercy on a bear. <laughs> a very pretty bear. A boy or a child, I wonder. A pretty one. A very pretty one. Sure, some scape. Though I am not bookish, yet I can read waiting gentlewoman in the scape. This has been some stair work, some trunk work, some behind door work. They were warmer that got this, and the poor thing is here. I'll take it on for pity, yet I'll tarry till my son come. Your lord, but even now. Lord! Whoa, whoa! What? Our son here? If thou see a thing to talk on when thou art dead and rotten, come in then. <gasps> what ails thee, man? I have seen two such sights, by sea and by land. But I'm not to say it is a sea, for it is now the sky. Betwixt the firmament and it, you cannot thrust a bodkin's point. Why, boy, how is it? Would you did but see how it chafes, how it rages, how it takes up the shore, but that's not to the point. Oh, the most piteous cry of the poor souls. Sometimes to see him and not to see him. Now the ship's boring the moon with a mainmast and, and on swallowed with yeast and froth as you thrust a cork into a hogshead. And then for the land service... To see how the bear tore out his shoulder bone oh. and how he cried to me for help. And he said his name was Antigonus, a noble man. Oh. But to make an end of the ship, to see how the sea flap dragoned it. But first, how the poor souls roared and the sea mocked him. And how that poor gentleman roared and the bear mocked him, both roaring louder than the sea or weather. Man of mercy, when was this, boy? Now, now, what? Wind since I saw these sights. The men are not yet cold on the water, nor the bear half dined on the gentleman. Who's at it now? Would I had been by to have helped the old uh, man. Would you had been by the ship's side to have helped today? Your charity would have lacked footing. Every matters, every matters. But look the ear, boy. Now, bless thyself. Thou met'st with things dying, I with things new born. Here's a sight for thee. Look thee, a bearing cloth for a squire's child. Look thee, take up, take up, boy, open it. So, let's see. It was told me I should be rich by the fairies. This is some changeling. Opened, what's within, boy? You're a maid, old man. If the sins of your youth are forgiven you, you're well to live. <laughs> Gold! Old gold! <laughs> this is fairy gold, boy, and twill prove so. Up with it, keep it close. Home, home, the next way. We are lucky, boy, and to be so still requires nothing but secrecy. Let me sheep go. Come, good boy, the next way home. Go you the next way with your findings. I'll go see if the bear be gone from the gentleman and how much he hath eaten. They are never cursed but when they're hungry. If there be anything of him left, I'll bury it. That's a good deed. Hmm. If thou mayst discern by that which is left of him what he is, fetch me to the sight of Mary him. will I, and you shall help to put him in the ground. Uh, Tis a lucky day, boy, and we'll do good deeds on it. I that please some, try all. 
both joy and terror, of good and bad, that makes and unfolds error. Now take upon me, in the name of time, to use my wings. Impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage that I slide o'er sixteen years and leave the growth untried of that wide gap, since it is in my power to o'erthrow law and in one self-born hour to plant and o'erwhelm custom. Let me pass, the same I am ere ancient's order was, or what is now received. I witness to the times that brought them in, so shall I do to the freshest things now reigning, and make stale the glistering of this present, as my tale now seems to it. Your patience this allowing, I turn my glass, and give my scene such growing as you had slept, between. Leontes leaving, the effects of his fond jealousies so grieving that he shuts up himself. Imagine me, gentle spectators, that I now may be in fair Bohemia, and remember well I mentioned a son of the kings, which Florizel I now name to you, and with speed so paced to speak of Perdita, now grown in grace, equal with wandering. What of her ensues, I list not prophesy, but let time's news be known when tis brought forth. A shepherd's daughter, and what to her adheres, which follows after, is the argument of time. Of this allow, if ever you have spent time worse ere now. If never, yet that time herself doth say, she wishes earnestly you never may. My lord Polixenes. I pray thee, good Camillo, be no more importunate. Tis a sickness denying thee anything, a death to grant this. It is fifteen years since I saw my country. And though I have for the most part been aired abroad, I desire to lay my bones there. Besides, the penitent king, my master, hath sent for me. To whose feeling sorrows I might be of some allay, or I owe ween to think so, which is another spur to my departure. As thou lovest me, Camillo, wipe not out the rest of thy services by leaving me now. The need I have of thee thine own goodness hath made. Better not to have had thee than thus to want thee. Thou, having made me businesses which none without thee can sufficiently manage, must either stay to execute them thyself, or take away with thee the very services thou hast done, which, Lord... if I have not enough considered, as too much I cannot, to be more thankful to thee shall be my study, and my profit therein the heaping friendships of that fatal country, Sicilia, prithee speak no more, whose very naming punishes me with the remembrance of that penitent, as thou callst him, and reconciled king, my brother, whose loss of his most precious queen and children are even now to be afresh lamented. Say to me, when sawst thou the Prince Florizel, my son? Kings are no less unhappy, their issue not being gracious, than they are in losing them when they have approved their virtues. Sir, it is three days since I saw the Prince. What his happier affairs may be are to me unknown, but I have missingly noted he is of late much retired from court mm. and is less frequent to his princely exercises than formerly he hath appeared. I have considered so much, Camillo, and with some care, so far that I have eyes under my service which look upon his removedness, from whom I have this intelligence, that he is seldom from the house of a most homely shepherd. A man, they say, that from very nothing, and beyond the imagination of his neighbours, is grown into an unspeakable estate. I have heard, sir, of such a man, who hath a daughter of most rare note. The report of her has extended more than can be thought to begin from such a cottage. That's likewise part of my intelligence. But I fear the angle that plucks our son thither. Thou shalt accompany us to the place, where we will, not appearing what we are, have some question with the shepherd, from whose simplicity I think it not uneasy to get the cause of my son's resort thither. Prithee, be my present partner in this business, and lay aside thoughts of Cecilia. I willingly obey your command. My best Camillo, we must uh, disguise ourselves. 
When daffodils begin to peer, with hay the doxy over the dale, why then comes in the sweet of the year, for the red blood reigns in the winter's pale. The white sheet bleaching on the hedge, with hay the sweet birds, oh how they sing, doth set my pugging tooth on edge, for a quart of veil is a dish for a king. The lark, the tear, a lear, a chance With hay, with hay, the thrush and the jay Are summer songs for me and my aunts While we lie tumbling in the hay I have served Prince Florizel And in my time wore three pile But now I'm out of service But shall I go mourn for that, my dear The pale moon shines by night and when I wander here and there, I then do most go right. If tinkers may have leave to live and bear the sowskin budget, then my account I well may give and in the stocks about it. <sighs> My traffic is sheets, and the kite builds look to lesser linen. My father named me Autolycus, who being, as I am, littered under mercury, was likewise a snapper-up of unconsidered trifles. With dye and drab I purchased this caparison, and my revenue is a silly cheat. Gallows and knock are too powerful on the highway, beating and hanging are terrors to me. For the life to come... Oh, I sleep out the thought of it. A prize! A prize! 500, Sean. What comes the wall to? If the springe hold the cock's mind. Oh, I cannot do without counters. Let me see. What am I to buy for our sheep shearing feast? A three pound of sugar, five pound of currants, rice. What will this sister remind you with rice? But my father hath made her mistress of the feast, and she lays it on. Oh, I must have saffron to colour the warden's pies. Mace. Dates, none. That's after my note. Nutmegs, seven. A racer to a ginger. But that I may beg. A four pound of prunes. Oh, that ever I was born. The name of me. Oh, help me, help me. Pluck but off these rags and then death. Death. Oh, like poor soul. Oh. Thou hast oh. need of more rags to lay on thee rather than have these off. Oh, sir, the loathsomeness of them offend me more than the stripes I have received, which are mighty ones and millions. Oh, that's poor man. A million of beating may come to a great matter. I am robbed, sir, and beaten. My money and apparel tain from me, and these detestable things put upon me. What, by a horseman or a footman? A footman, sweet sir, a footman. Oh, indeed, he should be a footman by the garments he hath left with thee. If this be a horseman's coat, it hath seen very hard service. <laughs> let me thy hand, I'll help thee. Uh, Come, let me thy hand. Uh, oh, good sir, tenderly. Oh, oh. alas, poor soul. Uh, oh, good sir, softly, good sir. Oh, uh, I fear, sir, uh, my shoulder blade is out. Oh, how now, canst stand? Softly, dear sir. Good sir, softly. You have done me a charitable office. Um, <laughs> dost lack any money? Uh, I have a little money for thee. No, good sweet sir, I beseech you, sir. I have a kinsman not past three quarters of a mile hence, unto whom I was going. Oh. I shall there have money or anything I want. Offer me no money, I pray you. That kills my heart. W what manner of fellow was he that robbed you? A fellow, sir, that I have known to go about with troll my dames. Mm. I knew him once, a servant of the prince. I cannot tell, good sir, for which of his virtues it was, but he was certainly whipped out of the court. Uh, his vices, you would say. There's no virtue whipped out of the court. They cherish it to make it stay there, mm. and yet it will no more but abide. Ah, uh, vices, I would say, sir. I know this man well. He had been since an ape-bearer, then a process-server, a bailiff. Then he compassed a motion of the prodigal son and married a tinker's wife within a mile where my land and living lies, and having flown over many knavish professions... He settled only in rogue. Some call him Autolycus. Oh, out upon him. Prig for my life. Prig! He haunts wakes, fairs and bear baitings. Very true, sir. He, sir, he. That's the rogue that put me into this apparel. Oh, not a more cowardly rogue in old Bohemia. If you had but looked big and spit at him, he'd have run. Oh, I must confess to you, sir, I... I, I am no fighter. Oh. I am false of heart that way. And that he knew I warrant him. Uh, how do you now? Sweet sir, oh, much better than I was. Oh, oh, I can stand and walk. 
I will even take my leave of you and pace softly towards my kinsman. Shall I bring thee on the way? No, good face, sir. No, sweet, sir. Then fare thee well. I must go buy spices for our sheep shearing. Prosper you, sweet, sir. Now then, have Your purse is not hot enough to purchase your spice. I'll be with you at your sheep shearing, too. If I make not this cheat bring out another, and the shearers prove sheep, let me be unrolled and my name put in the book of virtue. Jog on, jog on the footpath way, and merrily hent the styler, a merry heart goes on. Camillo, by my life, each swain bedecks his shepherdess with flowers, whilst we are swathed about with sober garb to mask our outward features from our son. Who yonder comes in like disguise himself, mm. his natural grace outshone by her humours. We'll stand aside and mark what they do say. These here are unusual weeds, to each part of you does give a life, no shepherdess. But Flora, peering in April's front, this your sheep shearing is as a meeting of the petty gods and you the queen on Sir, my gracious lord, to chide at your extremes, it not becomes me, oh, pardon that I name them. Your high self, the gracious mark of the land, you have obscured with a swain's wearing, and me, poor lowly maid, most goddess-like, pranked up. But that our feasts in every mess have folly, and the feeders digest it with a custom, I should blush to see you so attired. Swoon, I think, to show myself a glass. I bless the time when my good falcon made her flight across thy father's ground. Now, Jove, afford you cause. To me the difference forges dread. Your greatness hath not been used to fear. Even now I tremble to think your father by some accident should pass this way as you did. Oh, the fates. How would he look to see his work so noble, vilely bound up? What would he say? Or how should I in these my borrowed flaunts behold the sternness of his presence? Apprehend nothing but jollity. Oh. The gods themselves, humbling their deities to love, have taken the shapes of beasts upon them. Jupiter became a bull and bellowed. The green Neptune a ram and bleated. And the fire-robed god, golden Apollo, a poor humble swain, as I seem now. Their transformations were never for a piece of beauty rarer, oh. nor in a way so chaste, since my desires run not before mine honour, nor my lusts burn hotter than my faith. Oh, but, sir, your resolution cannot hold when tis opposed as it must be by the power of the king. One of these two must be necessities, which then will speak, that you must change this purpose, or I my life. Thou dearest Perdita, with these forced thoughts, I prithee darken not the mirth of the feast, or I'll be thine, my fair, or not my father's. For I cannot be mine own, nor anything to any, if I be not thine. To this I am most constant, though destiny say no. Be merry, gentle. Strangle <laughs> such thoughts as these with anything that you behold the while. Oh, your guests are coming. <laughs> Lift up your countenance, as twere the day of celebration of that nuptial which we two have sworn shall come. <laughs> oh, Lady Fortune, stand you auspicious. See your guests approach, address yourself to entertain them sprightly, and let's be red with mirth. <laughs> my daughter, oh. when my old wife lived upon this day, she was both banker, bowler, cook, both dame and servant, welcomed all, served all. Would sing a song and dance her turn, now we hear a dupper into the table, now with the middle on his shoulder and his her face a fire with labour. Then she took to quench it. She would do each one sip. You are retired as if you were a feasted one and not the hostess of the meeting. Pray you bid these unknown friends to his welcome, for it is a way to make us better friends. More law, go on, quench your blushes and present yourself that which you are, mistress of the feast. Come on, and bid us welcome to your sheep shearing as your good flock shall prosper. Sir, welcome. It is my father's will I should take on me the hostess ship of the day. Oh, you're welcome, sir. <laughs> Give me those flowers there, Dorcas. 
Reverend sirs, for you there's rosemary and rue. Mm. These keep seeming and savour all the winter long. Grace and remembrance be to you both. And welcome to our shearing. <laughs> Shepherdess, a fair one, are you? Well, you fit our ages with flowers of winter. Sir, the year growing ancient, not yet on summer's death, nor on the birth of trembling winter. The fairest flowers of the seasons are our carnations and street gillivores, which some call nature's bastards. Of that kind are rustic gardens barren, and I care not to get slips of them. Wherefore, gentle maiden, do you neglect them? But I have heard it said there is an art which in their piousness shares with great creating nature. So there be, yet nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean. So over that art, which you say adds to nature, is an art that nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry a gentler scion to the wildest stock and make conceive a bark of baser kind by bud of nobler race. This is an art which does mend nature, change it rather, but uh, the art itself is nature. So it is. <laughs> then make your garden rich in gillivores and do not call them bastards. I'll not put the dibble in earth to set one slip of them. No more than were I painted, I would wish this youth should say twere well, and only therefore desire to breed by me. Here's flowers for you. Hot lavender, mince, savoury, marjoram, the marigold that goes to bed with sun and with him rises weeping. These are flowers of middle summer, and I think they're given to men of middle age. <laughs> You're very welcome. I should leave grazing were I of your flock. And only live by gazing. Out, oh, alas! You'd be so lean that blasts of January would blow you through and through. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, my fairest friend, I would I had some flowers of the spring that might become your time of day. And yours, and yours, that wear upon your virgin branches, yet your maidenhead's growing. Oh, Proserpina, for the flowers now that frighten thou lets fall from Dis's wagon. Daffodils that come before the swallow dares and take the winds of March with beauty. Violets, dim, but sweeter than the lids of Juno's eyes or Cytherea's breath. Pale primroses that die unmarried ere they can behold bright Phoebus in his strength. A malady most incident to maids. Bold oxlips and the crown imperial. Lilies of all kinds, the flowers to loose being one. Oh, these I lack to make you garlands of, and my sweet friend to strew him o'er and o'er. What, like a course? <laughs> no, like a bank for love to lie and play on, not like a course. <laughs> or if not, to be buried, but quick and in mine arms. Come, take your flowers. Methinks our players have seen them do in wits and pastorals. So this robe of mine has changed my disposition. What you do still betters what is done. When you speak, sweet... I'd have you do it ever. When you sing, I'd have you buy and sell so, so give alms, pray so. And for the ordering your affairs, to sing them too. When you do dance, I wish you a way for the sea, that you might ever do nothing but that. Move still, still so, and own no other function. Each you're doing, so singular in each particular, crowns what you're doing in the present deeds that all your acts are queens. Oh, Doricles, your praises are too large, but that your youth and the true blood which peeps fairly through it do plainly give you out an unstained shepherd. <laughs> With wisdom, I might fear, my Doricles, you wooed me the false way. I think you have as little skill to fear as I have purpose to put you to it. But come, our dance, I pray. <laughs> your hand, my Perdita. So turtles pair that never mean to part? I'll swear for him. <laughs> this is the prettiest low-born lass that ever ran on the greensward. Nothing she does or seems, but smacks of something greater than herself. Too noble for this place. <laughs> he tells her something that makes her blood look out. Mm. Good sooth. She is the queen of curds and cream. <laughs> Come on, strike up! The matzo must be your mistress. Indeed, garlic to make kissing with. Now, in good time. Not a word, a word. We stand upon our manners. Come, strike up. Woo! 
Pray, good shepherd, what fair swain is this which dances with your daughter? They call him Doricles, and boasts himself to have a worthy feeding, but I have it upon his own report, and I believe it. He looks like sooth. He says he loves my daughter. I think so too, for never gaze the moon upon the water as he'll stand and read as to my daughter's eyes, and to be plain. I think there is not half a kiss to choose who loves another best. She dances featly. So she does anything, though I report it, that should be silent. If young Doricles do light upon her, she shall bring him that which he not dreams of. Oh, master, if you did but hear the peddler at the door, you would never dance again after tabor and pipe. No, the bagpipe could not move you. He sings several tunes faster than you'll tell money. He utters them as he'd eaten ballads, and all men's ears grew to his tunes. Oh, it could never <laughs> come better. He shall come in. Oh, I love a ballad, but even too well, if it be doleful matter, merrily sat down. <laughs> or a very pleasant thing, indeed, and sung lamentably. He hath songs for man or woman of all sizes. No milliner can so fit his customers with gloves. He has the prettiest love songs for maids. So without baldry, which is strange, with such delicate burdens of dildos and fadings, jumper and thumper, and where some stretch-mouthed rascal would, as it were, mean mischief and break a foul gap into the matter, he makes the maid to answer, whoop, do me no harm, good man, puts him up, slights him with, whoop, do me no harm, good man. <laughs> this is a brave fellow. Oh, yeah. believe me, thou talks of an admirable, conceited fellow. Has he any unbraided way? No. He had ribbons of all the colours of the rainbow. Huh? Points more than all the lawyers in Bohemia can learnedly handle, though they come to him by the gross. Incomes, caddises, cambrics, lawns. Why, he sings them over as they were gods or goddesses. <laughs> you would think a smock were a she-angel. His old chance to the sleeve hand and the work about the square on. <laughs> Freddy, bring him in and let him approach singing. Forewarn him that he use no scurrilous words in tunes. <laughs> you have of these peddlers that have more in them than you'd think, sister. Aye, good brother, or go about to think. As damask roses, masks for faces and for noses, bugle bracelet, necklace amber, perfume for a lady's chamber, golden quaffs and stomachers for my lads to give their dears. Pins and poking sticks of steel, what maids lack from head to heel. Come by of me, come, come by, come by, by lads, or else your lasses cry. Come by! Oh. <laughs> Oh, if I were not in love with Mopsa, thou shouldst take no money of me. But being enthralled as I am, it will also be the bondage of certain ribbons and gloves. <laughs> come by with me, come by, come by. And you shall pay well for them. This is not too far gone, Camilla. It is time to part them. He's simple and tells much. How oh, now, fair shepherd? Your heart is full of something that does take your mind from feasting. Sooth, when I was young and handed love as you do, I was wont to load my she with knacks. <laughs> I would have ransacked the peddler's silken treasury and have poured it to her acceptance. You let him go and nothing marted with him. If your lass interpretation should abuse and call this your lack of love or bounty, you were straited for a reply, at least if you make a care of happy holding her. Old sir, I know she prizes not such trifles as these are. The gifts she looks from me are packed and locked up in my heart, which I have given already, but not delivered. Oh, hear me breathe my life before this ancient sir, whom it should seem hath sometime loved. <laughs> I take thy hand, this hand, as soft as dove's down and as white as it, or Ethiopian's tooth, or the fanned snow that's bolted by the northern blasts twice o'er. What follows this? How prettily the young swain seems to wash. The hand was fair before. Oh, I've put you out. But to, to your protestation, let me hear what you profess. Do, and be witness to it. 
And this my neighbour too? And he, and more than he, and men, the earth, the heavens, and all, that were I crowned the most imperial monarch, thereof most worthy, were I the fairest youth that ever made I swerve, had force and knowledge more than was ever man's, I would not prize them without her love. For her, employ them all, commend them and condemn them to her service or to their own perdition. Fairly offered. This shows a sound affection. But my daughter, say you the like, dame? I cannot speak so well, nothing so well, no, nor mean better. By the pattern of mine own thoughts, I cut out the purity of his. There can, a bargain. And friends unknown, you shall bear witness to it. I give my daughter to him and will make her portion equal his. Oh, that must be the virtue of your daughter. One being dead, I shall have more than you can dream of yet. What? Enough, then, for your wonder. But come on, contract us before these witnesses. Come, your hand and daughter, your Soft sway in a while, beseech you. Um, have you a father? I have, but what of him? Knows he of this? He neither does nor shall. He thinks a father is at the nuptial of his son, a guest that best becomes the table. Pray you once more, is not your father grown incapable of reasonable affairs, eh? Is he not stupid with age and altering rooms? Can he speak? Here, no man from man, dispute his own estate? Lies he not bedridden and again does nothing but what he did, being childish? No, good sir, he has his health and ampler strength indeed than most have of his age. By my white beard, you offer him, if this be so, a wrong, something unfilial. Reason, my son, should choose himself a wife, but as good reason, the father, all whose joy is nothing else but fair posterity, should hold some counsel in such a business. I yield all this, but for some other reasons, my grave sir, which tis not fit, you know, I not acquaint my father of this business. Let him know it. He shall not. Prithee, let him. No, he must not. Let him, my son. He shall not need to grieve at knowing of thy choice. Come, come, he must not. Mark our contract. Mark your divorce, young sir, whom son I dare not call. Thou art too base to be acknowledged. Thou, a scepter's heir, that thus affects a sheep hook. Thou, old traitor, I'm sorry that by hanging thee I can but shorten thy life one week. And thou, fresh piece of excellent witchcraft who of force must know the royal fool thou copes with. Oh, my I'll have thy beauty scratched with briars and made more homely than thy state. For thee, fond boy, if I may ever know thou dost but sigh that thou no more shalt see this knack, as never I mean thou shalt, we'll bar thee from succession, not hold thee of our blood, no, not our kin, farther than Deucalion oft. Mark thou my words. Follow us to the court. Thou, churl, for this time, though full of our displeasure, yet we free thee from the dead blow of it. And you, enchantment, worthy enough a herdsman, yea, him too that makes himself, but for our honour therein unworthy thee, if ever henceforth thou these rural latches to his entrance open, or hoop his body more with thy embraces, I will devise a death as cruel for thee as thou art tender to it. Even here undone. I was not much afeard, for once or twice I was about to speak and tell him plainly. The self-same sun that shines upon his court hides not his visage from our cottage but looks on alike. Would it please you, sir, be gone? I told you what would become of this. Beseech you, of your own state, take care. This dream of mine, being now awake, I'll queen it no inch further, but milk my ewes and weep. Why, how now, father? Speak, ere thou diest. I cannot speak, nor think, nor dare to know that which I know. Oh, sir, you have undone a man of fourscore three, 
that thought to fill his grave in quiet, yea, to die upon the bed. My father died to lie close by his honest bones, but now some hangman must put on my shroud and lay me where no priest shovels in dust. Oh, cursed wretch that noosed this was the prince and wouldst adventure to mingle faith with him. Undone! Undone! If I might die within this hour, I have lived to die when I desire. <laughs> Why look you so upon me? I am but sorry, not afeard, delayed, but nothing altered. What I was, I am, more straining on for plucking back, not following my leash unwillingly. Gracious, my lord, you know your father's temper. At this time, he will allow no speech, which I do guess you do not purpose to him, and as hardly will he enjoy your sight as yet, I fear. Then, till the fury of his highness settle, come not before him. I not purpose it. I think, Camillo? Even he, my lord. How often have I told you to be thus? How often said my dignity would last but till to a no? It cannot fail but by the violation of my faith. And then let nature crush the sides of the earth together and mar the seeds within. Lift up thy looks! From my succession, wipe me, father. I am heir to my affection. Be advised. I am, and by my fancy, if my reason will thereto be obedient, I have reason. If not, my senses, better pleased with madness, do bid it welcome. This is desperate, sir. So call it, but it does fulfil my vow. I needs must think it honesty. Camillo, not for Bohemia, nor the pomp that may be thereat gleaned, for all the sun sees, or the close earth wombs, or the profound seas hides in unknown fathoms, will I break my oath to this my fair beloved. Therefore, I pray you, as you've e'er been my father's honoured friend, when he shall miss me, as in faith I mean not to see him any more, cast your good counsels upon his passion, let myself and fortune tug for the time to come. This you may know, and so deliver. I am put to sea with her who here I cannot hold on shore, and most opportune to our need I have a vessel rides fast by, but not prepared for this design. What course I mean to hold shall nothing benefit your knowledge, nor concern me the reporting. Oh, my lord, I would your spirit were easier for advice or stronger for your need. Hark, Perdita, I'll hear you by and by. He's irremovable, resolved for flight. Now were I happy if his going I could frame to serve my turn, save him from danger, do him love and honour, purchase the sight again of dear Cecilia and that unhappy king, my master, whom I so much thirst to see. Now, good Camillo, I am so fraught with curious business that I leave out ceremony. Sir, I think you have heard of my poor services of the love I have borne your father. Very nobly have you deserved it. It is my father's music to speak your deeds, not little of his care to have them recompensed as thought on. Well, my lord... If you may please to think I love the king, and through him what's nearest to him, which is your gracious self, embrace but my direction. If your more ponderous and settled project may suffer alteration, on mine honour, I'll point you where you shall have such receiving as shall become your highness, where you may enjoy your mistress, from the whom I see there's no disjunction to be made, but by, as heavens forfend, your ruin. Marry her. And with my best endeavours in your absence, your discontenting father strive to qualify and bring him up to liking. Oh. How, Camillo, may this almost a miracle be done, that I may call thee something more than man, and after that trust to thee? Have you thought on a place where to you go? Not any yet, but as the unthought-on accident is guilty to what we wildly do, so we profess ourselves to be the slaves of chance and flies of every wind that blows. Then this to me. This follows, if you will not change your purpose, but undergo this flight. Make for Cecilia, and there present yourself and your fair princess, for so I see she must be, for Leontes. She shall be habited as it becomes the partner of your bed. Methinks I see Leontes opening his free arms and weeping his welcomes forth, asks thee, the son, forgiveness as to the father's person, kisses the hands of your fresh princess, o'er and o'er divides him twixt his unkindness and his kindness. The one he chides to hell and bids the other grow faster than thought or time. Worthy Camillo, what colour for my visitation shall I hold up before him? Sent by the king your father to greet him and to give him comforts. Sir, the manner of your bearing towards him with what you, as from your father, shall deliver, things known betwixt us three, I'll write you down. 
the which shall point you forth at every city what you must say, that he shall not perceive, but you have your father's bosom there, and speak his very heart. I'm bound to you, there is some sap in this. Of course, more promising than a wild dedication of yourselves to unpathed waters, undreamed shores, most certain to miseries enough, no hope to help you, but as you shake off one to take another. Nothing so certain as your anchors, who do their best office if they can but stay you where you'll be loath to be. Besides, you know, prosperity's the very bond of love, whose fresh complexion and whose heart together affliction alters. One of these is true. I think affliction may subdue the cheek, but not take in the mind. Yea, say you so. There shall not at your father's house these seven years be born another such. Oh, my good Camillo, she is as forward of her breeding as she is in the rear our birth. I cannot say it is pity she lacks instruction, for she seems a mistress to most that teach. <laughs> Pardon, oh. sir, for this I'll blush you thanks. My prettiest perdita. But, oh, the thorns we stand upon. Camillo, preserver of my father, now of me, the medicine of our house, how shall we do? We are not furnished like Bohemia's son, nor shall appear in Sicilia. My lord, fear none of this. I think you know my fortunes to all lie there. It shall be so my care to have you royally appointed as if the scene you play were mine. For instance, sir, that you may know you shall not want one word. Ha <laughs> ha! What a fool honesty is! And trust his sworn brother, a very simple gentleman. I've sold all my trumpery. Not a counterfeit stone. Not a ribbon, glass, pomander, brooch, table book, ballad, knife, tape, glove, shoe tie, bracelet, horn ring. To keep my pack from fasting. They throng who should buy first. As if my trinkets had been hallowed and brought a benediction to the buyer. By which means I saw whose purse was best in picture. And what I saw, to my good use, I remembered. My clown who wants but something to be a reasonable man, grew so in love with the wench's song that he would not stir his petty toes till he had both tune and words, which so drew the rest of the herd to me that all their other senses stuck in ears. Huh. He might have pinched a placket. It was senseless. It was nothing to geld a codpiece of a purse. I would have filed keys off that hung in chains. No hearing, no feeling but my sir's song and admiring the nothing of it. So, that in this time of lethargy, I picked and cut most of their festival purses. And had not the old man come in with a hubbub against his daughter and the king's son, and scared my chuffs from the chaff, I had not left a purse alive in the whole army. Nay, but my letters, by this means being there, so soon as you arrive, shall clear that doubt. If they have overheard me now, why hanging? And those that you'll procure from King Leontes... Shall satisfy your father. Happy be you. All that you speak shows fair. Who have we here? <laughs> we'll make an instrument of this. Omit nothing may give us aid. <laughs> now, now, good fellow, why shakes thou so? <laughs> not man. He has no harm intended to thee. Oh, I am a poor fellow, sir. Why, be so still. Yes, nobody will steal that from thee. Uh, yet, for the outside of thy poverty, we must make an exchange. Oh. Therefore, discase thee instantly. Oh. Oh. That thou must think there's a necessity in oh. And change garments with this gentleman. Oh. Though the pennyworth on his side be the worst, yet hold thee. There's some boot. Oh, I'm a poor fellow, sir. I know ye well enough. Nay, prithee, dispatch. The gentleman is half flayed already. Are you in earnest, sir? I smell the trick on Dispatch, I prithee. Indeed, I have had earnest, but I cannot with conscience take it. Unbuckle, unbuckle. Oh. Oh. Fortunate mistress, let my prophecy come home to ye. You must retire yourself into some covert, take your sweetheart's hat and pluck it o'er your brows, muffle your face, dismantle you, and as you can, dislike on the truth of your own seeming, that you may, for I do fear eyes over, to shipboard get undescribed. I see the place so lies that I must bear a part. No remedy. Have you done there? Uh, should I now meet my father, he would not call me son. Nay, you shall have no hat. Uh, oh. Come, lady, come. Farewell, my friend. Adieu, sir. What I do next shall be to tell the king of this escape and whither they are bound, wherein my hope is I shall so prevail to force him after, in whose company I shall review Cecilia, for whose sight I have a woman's longing. Fortune speed us. Thus we set on, Camillo, to the sea's side. The swifter speed, the better. I understand the business. I hear it. To have an open ear, a quick eye, and a nimble hand is necessary for a cut purse. 
A good nose is requisite also to smell out work for other senses. I see this is the time that the unjust man doth thrive. What an exchange had this been without boot. <laughs> what a boot is here with this exchange. Sure, the gods do this year connive at us, and we may do anything extempore. The prince himself is about a piece of iniquity, stealing away from his father with his clog at his heels. If I thought it were a piece of honesty to acquaint the king with all, I would not do it. I hold it the more knavery to conceal it, and therein am I constant to my profession. See, see what a man you are now. Aside, aside, here is more matter for a hot brain. Every lane's end, every shop, church, session, hanging, yields a careful man work. There is no other way but to tell the king she's a changeling and none of your flesh and blood. Nay, but hear me. Nay, but hear me. Oh, go to then. She being none of your flesh and blood, your flesh and blood has not offended the king. And so your flesh and blood is not to be punished by him. <sighs> Show those things you found about her. Those secret things, all but what she has with her. This being done, let the law go whistle, I warrant you. I will tell the king all, every word, yea, and his son's pranks too. Who, I may say, is no honest man, neither uh. to his father nor to me, to go about to make me the king's brother-in-law. <laughs> Indeed, brother-in-law was the farthest off you could have been to him. And then your blood had been the dearer by... I uh, know not how much an ounce. <laughs> Very wisely, puppies. <laughs> I know not what impediment this complaint may be to the flight of my master. Though I'm not naturally honest, I am so sometimes by chance. Let me pocket up my peddler's disguise. Well, let us be There is that in this vardle will make him scratch his beard. Uh, pray heartily, he be at palace. <laughs> oh, no, rustic. <laughs> Whither are you bound? Uh, to the palace, I'm like, your worship. Your affairs there. What, with whom, the condition of that fardel, mm. the place of your dwelling, your names, your ages, of what having, breeding, and anything that is fitting to be known. Discover. Uh, we are but plain fellows, sir. A lie. You are rough and hairy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me have no lying. It becomes none but tradesmen. And they often give us soldiers the lie. But we pay them for it with stamped coin, not stabbing steel. Therefore, they do not give us the lie. <laughs> your worship had like to have given us one, if you had not taken yourself with the manner. Are you a courtier? I'm like you, sir. Whether it like me or no, I am a courtier. Oh. Seest thou not the air of the court in these enfoldings? Hath not my gait in it the measure of the court? Oh. Receives not thy nose court odour from me? <laughs> Reflect I not on thy baseness, court contempt? Thinks thou, for that I insinuate, to toes from thee thy business, I am therefore no courtier. I am courtier cap a pied, and one that will either push on or pluck back thy business there. Whereupon I command thee to open thy affair. My business, sir, is to the king. What advocate hast thou to him? I know not, am I? Advocates, the court word for a pheasant. Say you have none. Uh, none, sir. I have no pheasant, cock nor end. Ah, uh, how blessed are we that are not simple men. <laughs> Yet nature might have made me as these are. Therefore, I'll not disdain. It, this cannot be but a great courtier. His garments are rich, but he wears them not handsomely. Yet he seems to be the more noble in being fantastical. <laughs> A great man, I'll warrant. I know by the picking on his teeth. Mm. The fardel there. What's in the fardel? Wherefore that box? Uh, sir, there lies such secrets in this fardel and box which none must know but the king, uh. and which he shall know within this hour if I may come to the speech of him. Age, thou hast lost thy labour. Uh, why, sir? The king is not at the palace. He's gone aboard a new ship to purge melancholy and air himself. Oh. For if thou beest capable of things serious, thou must know the king is full of grief. So it is said, sir, about his son that should have married a shepherd's daughter. If that shepherd be not in hand fast, let him fly. The curses he shall have, the tortures he shall feel, will break the back of man, the heart of monster. Think you so, sir? Not he alone shall suffer what wit can make heavy and vengeance bitter. But those that are germane to him, though removed fifty times, shall all come under the hangman. Uh, which, though it be great pity, yet it is necessary. An old sheep-whistling rogue, a ram-tender, to offer to have his daughter come into grace? <laughs> Some say he shall be stoned. But that death is too soft for him, say I. Draw our throne into a sheep-coat. 
All deaths are too few. The sharpest, too easy. The... Has the old man heir a son, sir, do you hear? And like you, sir? He has a son who shall be flayed alive. <sighs> then, anointed over with honey, set on the head of a wasp's nest, then stand till he be three quarters and a dram dead. Uh. Then recovered again with aqua vitae, or some other hot infusion, then raw as he is, and in the hottest day prognostication proclaims, shall he be set against a brick wall, the sun looking with a southward eye upon him, where he is to behold him with flies blown to death. Ooh. Ah. Oh, but what talk we of these traitorly rascals, whose miseries are to be smiled at, their offences being so capital. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Tell me. For you seem to be honest, plain men. What you have to the king, being something gently considered, I'll bring you where he is aboard, tender your persons to his presence, whisper him in your behalfs, and if it be in man besides the king to effect your suits, here is man shall do it. He seems to be of great authority. Mm. Close with him, give him gold. Ooh. And though authority be a stubborn bear, yet he is oft led by the nose with gold. Mm. Show the inside of your purse to the outside of his hand, and no more ado. Remember, stoned and flayed alive. I'm pleased you, sir, to undertake the business for us. It is that gold I have. Uh -huh. I'll make it as much more and leave this young man in pawn till I bring it you. After I've done what I promised? Uh, aye, sir. Well, give me the moiety. Are you a party in this business? Uh, in some sort, sir. But though my case be a pitiful one, I hope I shall not be flayed out of it. Oh, that's the case of the shepherd's son. Hang him. He'll be made an example. Oh. Comfort, good comfort. We must to the king and show our strange signs. He must know it is none of your daughter nor my sister. We are gone else. Sir, I would give you as much as this old man does when the business is performed. And remain, as he says, your pawn till it be brought to you. I will trust you. A walk before, toward the seaside. <laughs> Go on the right hand. I will but look upon the hedge and follow you. Ah. We are but blessed in this man, as I may say, even blessed. Let's be fall as he bids us. He was provided to do us good. If I had a mind to be honest, I see fortune would not suffer me. She drops booties in my mouth. I am courted now with a double occasion. Gold and a means to do the prince my master good, which who knows how that may turn back to my advancement. I will bring these two moles, these blind ones, aboard him. If he think it fit to shore them again, and that the complaint they have to the king concerns him nothing, let him call me rogue for being so far officious, for I am proof against that title, and what shame else belongs to it. To him will I present them. There may be matter in it. Sir? Mm -hmm. You have done enough, and have performed a saint-like sorrow. And no fault could you make, which you have not redeemed, indeed paid down more penitence than done trespass. At the last, do as the heavens have done, forget your evil, with them forgive yourself. Whilst I remember her and her virtues, I cannot forget my blemishes in them, and so still think of the wrong I did myself, which was so much that airless it hath made my kingdom and destroyed the sweetest companion that e'er man bred his hopes out of. True, too true, my lord. If one by one you wedded all the world, or from the all that are took something good to make a perfect woman, she you killed would be unparalleled. I think so. Killed. She I killed. I did so. But that strikes me sorely to say I did. It is as bitter upon thy tongue as in my thought. Now, good now. Say so, but seldom. Not at all, good lady. You might have spoken a thousand things that would have done the time more benefit and graced your kindness better. You were one of those would have him wed again. If you would not so, you pity not the state, nor the remembrance of his most sovereign name. Consider little what dangers by his highness fail of issue may drop upon his kingdom and devour in certain lookers-on. What were more holy than to rejoice the former queen is well? What holier than... For royalty's repair, for present comfort and for future good, to bless the bed of majesty again with a sweet fellow to it. There is none worthy, respecting her that's gone. 
Besides, the gods will have fulfilled their secret purposes. For has not the divine Apollo said, is not the tenor of his oracle, that King Leontes shall not have an heir till his lost child be found? Which that it shall is all as monstrous to our human reason as my Antigonus to break his grave and come again to me, who on my life did perish with the infant. Tis your counsel, my lord, should to the heavens be contrary, oppose against their wills, care not for issue. The crown will find an heir. Great Alexander left his to the worthiest, so his successor was like to be the best. Good Paulina, who has the memory of Hermione, I know in honour. Oh, that ever I had squared me to thy counsel. Then even now I might have looked upon my queen's full eyes, have taken treasure from her lips. And left them more rich for what they yielded. Thou speaks truth. No more such wives, therefore... No wife. One worse and better used would make her sainted spirit again possess her corpse, and on this stage where we offenders move, appear so vexed and begin, why to me? Had she such power, she had just cause. She had, and would incense me to murder her I married. I should so. Were I the ghost that walked, I'd bid you mark her eye, and tell me for what dull part in it you chose her. Then I'd shriek that even your ears should rift to hear me, and the words that followed should be, Remember mine. Stars, stars, and all eyes else dead coals. Fear thou no wife, I'll have no wife, Paulina. Will you swear never to marry, but by my free leave? Never, Paulina, so be blessed my spirit. Then, good my lords, bear witness to his oath. You tempt him over much. Unless another, as like Hermione as is her picture, affront his eye, Good madam. I have done. Yet, if my lord will marry, if you will, sir, no remedy, but you will, give me the office to choose you a queen. She shall not be so young as was your former, but she shall be such as walked your first queen's ghost. It should take joy to see her in your arms. My true Paulina, we shall not marry till thou bidst us. That shall be when your first queen's again in breath. Never till then. My lord. One that gives out himself Prince Florizel, son of Polixenes, with yeah. his princess. She, the fairest I have yet beheld, desires access to your high presence. W what with him? He comes not like to his father's greatness. His approach, so out of circumstance and sudden, tells us tis not a visitation framed, but forced by need and accident. What train? But few, and those but mean. His princess, say you, with him? Aye, the most peerless piece of earth, I think, that e'er the sun shone bright on. Oh, Hermione, as every present time doth boast itself above a better gone, so must thy grave give way to what's seen now. Sir, you yourself have said and writ so, but your writing now is colder than that theme. She had not been nor was not to be equalled. Thus your verse flowed with her beauty once. Tis shrewdly ebbed to say you have seen a better. Pardon, madam. The one I have almost forgot. Your pardon. The other, when she has obtained your eye, will have your tongue too. This is a creature would she begin a sect might quench the zeal of all professors else. Make proselytes of who she but did follow. How? Not women. Women will love her that she is a woman, more worth than any man. Men, that she is the rarest of all women. Go, Cleomenes. Yourself assisted with your honoured friends, bring them to our embracement. Still tis strange he thus should steal upon us. Had our prince, jewel of children, seen this hour, he had paired well with this lord. There was not full a month between their births. Prithee no more, cease. Thou knowest he dies to me again when talked of. Sure, when I shall see this gentleman, thy speeches will bring me to consider that which may unfurnish me of reason. They are come. Your mother was most true to wedlock, Prince, for she did print your royal father off, conceiving you. Were I but twenty-one, your father's image is so hit in you, his very heir, 
that I should call you brother, as I did him, and speak of something wildly by us performed before. Most dearly welcome. And your fair princess, goddess. Oh, alas. I lost the couple that twixt heaven and earth might thus have stood begetting wonder, as you, gracious couple, do. And then I lost all mine own folly, the society, amity too, of your brave father, whom, though bearing misery, I desire my life once more to look on him. By his command have I here touched, Cecilia, and from him give you all greetings that a king at friend can send his brother. And but infirmity which waits upon worn times hath something seized his wished ability he had himself the lands and waters twixt your throne and his measured to look upon you. Whom he loves, he bade me say so, more than all the scepters and those that bear them living. Oh, my brother, good gentleman, the wrongs I have done thee stir afresh within me, and these thy offices so rarely kind are as interpreters of my behind-hand slackness. Welcome hither, as is the spring to the earth, and hath he too exposed this paragon to the fearful usage, at least ungentle, of the dreadful Neptune to greet a man not worth her pains, much less the adventure of her person? Good my lord, she came from Libya. Where the warlike Smalus, that noble honoured lord, is feared and loved. Most royal sir, from thence. From him whose daughter his tears proclaimed his parting with her. Thence, a prosperous south wind friendly, we have crossed to execute the charge my father gave me for visiting your highness. My best train I have from your Sicilian shores dismissed, who for Bohemia bend to signify not only my success in Libya, sir, but my arrival and my wife's in safety here where we are. The blessed gods purge all infection from our air whilst you do climate here. You have a holy father. A graceful gentleman against whose person, so sacred as it is, I have done sin, for which the heavens, taking angry note, have left me issueless. And your father's blessed, as he from heaven merits it, with you, worthy his goodness. What might I have been? Might I, a son and daughter, now have looked on such goodly things as you? Most noble, sir. That which I shall report will bear no credit were not the proof so nigh. Please you, great sir, Bohemia greets you from himself by me, desires you to attach his son, who has his dignity and duty both cast off, fled from his father, from his hopes, and with a shepherd's daughter. Where's Bohemia? Speak. Here in your city. I now came from him. I speak amazedly, and it becomes my marvel and my message. To your court, whilst he was hastening, in the chase, it seems, of this fair couple, meets he on the way the father of this seeming lady and her brother, having both their country quitted with this young prince. Camillo has betrayed me, whose honour and whose honesty till now endured all weathers. Late to his charge, he's with the king, your father. Who? Camillo? Camillo, sir. I spake with him, who now has these poor men in question. Never saw I wretches so quake. They kneel, they kiss the earth, forswear themselves as often as they speak. Bohemia stops his ears and threatens them with divers deaths in death. Oh, my poor father! The heaven set spies upon us will not have our contract celebrated. You are married? We are not, sir, nor are we like to be. The stars, I see, will kiss the valleys first. The odds for high and lows alike. My lord, is this the daughter of a king? She is, when once she is my wife. That once, I see by your good father's speed, will come on very slowly. I am sorry, most sorry, you were broken from his liking, where you were tied in duty, and as sorry your choice is not so rich in worth as beauty that you might well enjoy her. Dear, look up. Though fortune, visible an enemy, should chase us with my father, power no jot hath she to change our loves. Beseech you, sir, remember since you owed no more to time than I do now, with thought of such affections, step forth, mine advocate. At your request, my father will grant precious things as trifles. Would he do so, I'd beg your precious mistress, which he counts but a trifle. 
Sir, my liege, your eye hath too much youth in it. Not a month for your queen died, she was more worth such gazes than what you look on now. I thought of her even in these looks I made. But your petition is yet unanswered. I will to your father. Your honour not or thrown by your desires. I am friend to them and you. Upon which errand I now go toward him. Therefore follow me and mark what way I make. Come, good my lord. Beseech you, sir. Were you present at this relation? I was by, at the opening of the fardel. Heard the old shepherd deliver the manor how he found it. Whereupon, after a little amazedness, we were all commanded out of the chamber. Only this, methought I heard the shepherd say, he found the child. I would most gladly know the issue of it. <laughs> I make a broken delivery of the business, but the changes I perceived in the king and Camilla were very notes of admiration. They seemed almost with staring on one another to tear the cases of their eyes. There was speech in their dumbness, language in their very gesture. They looked as they had heard of a world ransomed or one destroyed. A notable passion of wonder appeared in them. But the wisest beholder that knew no more but seeing could not say if the importance were joy or sorrow. But in the extremity of the one it must needs be. Here comes a gentleman that happily knows more. Uh, the news, Rogero. Oh, nothing but bonfires. The oracle is fulfilled. The king's daughter is found. Ah, such a deal of wonder is broken out within this hour that ballad makers cannot be able to express it. <laughs> oh, no, here comes the Lady Paulina, Stuart. He can deliver you more. How goes it now, sir? This news, which is called true, is so like an old tale that the verity of it is in strong suspicion. Has the king found his heir? Most true, if ever truth were pregnant by circumstance. That which you hear, you'll swear, you see. There is such unity in the proofs. The mantle of Queen Hermione's, her jewel about the neck of it, the letters of Antigonus found with it, which they know to be his character, the majesty of the creature in resemblance of the mother, the affection of nobleness which nature shows above her breeding, and many other evidences proclaim her with all certainty to be the king's daughter. Uh, did you see the meeting of the two kings? Uh, no. Then you have lost a sight which was to be seen. It cannot be spoken of. There might you have beheld one joy crown another, so and in such manner that it seemed sorrow wept to take leave of them, for their joy waded in tears. There was casting up of eyes, holding up of hands, with countenance of such distraction that they were to be known by garment, not by favour. Our king, being ready to leap out of himself for joy of his found daughter, as if that joy were now become a loss, cries, Oh, thy mother, thy mother, then asks Bohemia forgiveness, then embraces his son-in-law, then again worries he his daughter with clipping her. Now he thanks the old shepherd, which stands by like a weather-bitten conduit of many king's reigns. I never heard of such another encounter, which lames report to follow it, and undoes description to do it. What, pray you, became of Antigonus that carried hence the child? like an old tale still, which will have matter to rehearse, although credit be asleep and not an ear open. He was torn to pieces with a bear. No. Uh, this avouches the shepherd's son, who has not only his innocence, which seems much to justify him, but a handkerchief and rings of his that Paulina knows. What became of his bark and his followers? Wrecked. The same instant of their master's death, and in the view of the shepherd, so that all the instruments which aided to expose the child were even then lost when it was found. But, oh, the noble combat that twixt joy and sorrow was fought in Paulina. She had one eye declined for the loss of her husband, another elevated that the oracle was fulfilled. She lifted the princess from the earth, and so locks her in embracing as if she would pin her to her heart, that she might no more be in danger of losing. Uh, the dignity of this act was worth the audience of kings and princes, for by such was it acted. One of the prettiest touches of all, and that which angled for mine eyes, caught the water, though not the fish, was when, at the relation of the queen's death, though with the manner how she came to it, bravely confessed and lamented by the king how attentiveness wounded his daughter, till from one sign of dolor to another she did with an alas. I would fain say bleed tears, for I'm sure my heart wept blood. Who was most marble there changed colour. Some swooned, all sorrowed. If all the world could have seen it, the woe had been universal. Are they returned to the court? No. 
The princess, hearing of her mother's statue, which is in the keeping of poor Lila, a piece many years in doing and now newly performed by that rare Italian master, Giulio Romano, who, had he himself eternity and could put breath into his work, would beguile nature of her custom, so perfectly he is her ape. He, so near to Hermione, hath done Hermione, that they say one would speak to her and stand in hope of answer. Uh, thither, with all greediness of affection, are they gone, and their intent to sup. Uh, I thought she had some great matter there in hand, mm. for she hath privately, twice or thrice a day, ever since the death of Hermione, visited that removed house. Shall we, thither, and with our company, peace the rejoicing? Yes. Who would be thence that has the benefit of access? Every wink of an eye, some new grace will be born. Yes. Our absence makes us unthrifty to our knowledge. Let's along. In. You now, had I not the dash of my former life in me, would preferment drop on my head? I brought the old man and his son aboard the prince, told him I heard them talk of a fardle and I know not what, but he at that time, over fond of the shepherd's daughter, so he then took her to be, who began to be much seasick and himself little better, extremity of weather continuing, this mystery remained undiscovered. <sighs> but tis all one to me, for had I been the finder out of this secret, it would not have relished among my other discredits. <laughs> ah. Here come those that I have done good to against my will and already appearing in the blossoms of their fortune. Come, boy, I am past my children, but thy sons and daughters will be all gentlemen born. Ah, you are well met, sir. <laughs> you denied to fight with me this other day because I was no gentleman born. <laughs> See you these clothes? Say you see them not, and think me still no gentleman born. <laughs> you will best say these robes are not gentleman born. Give me the lie, do, and try whether I am not now gentleman born. I know you are now, sir, a gentleman born. <laughs> Aye, and I've been so any time these four hours. And so have I, boy. Aye, so you have. But I was a gentleman born before my father. For the king's son took me by the hand and called me brother. And then the two kings called my father brother. And then the prince, my brother, and the princess, my sister, called my father father. And so we wept. And there was the first gentleman-like tears that ever we shed. We may live some to shed many more. Aye, or else twere hard luck being in so preposterous a state as we are. <laughs> I humbly beseech you, sir, to pardon me all the faults I have committed to your worship... And to give me your good report to the prince, my master. Uh, oh, bring this on, do, for we must be gentle, now we are gentlemen. Thou wilt amend thy life? Aye, and it like your good worship. Give me thy hand. Uh, I will swear to the prince thou art as honest a true fellow as any is in Bohemia. You may say it, but not swear it. Not swear it? Now I'm a gentleman. Let Boers and Franklin say it. I will swear it. How if it be false, son? If it be ne'er so false, a true gentleman may swear it on the behalf of his friend. And I'll swear to the prince that thou art a tall fellow of thy hands, and that thou wilt not be drunk. But I know that thou art no taller fellow of thy hands, and that thou wilt be drunk. But I'll swear it, and I would thou wouldst be a tall fellow of thy hands. I will prove so, sir, to my power. Aye, by any means prove a tall fellow. If I do not wonder how thou darest venture to be drunk, not being a tall fellow, trust me not. Hark, the kings and the princes, our kindred, are going to see the queen's picture. Come, follow us. We'll be thy good masters. <laughs> O oh, grave and good Paulina, the great comfort that I have had of thee. What, sovereign sir, I did not well, I meant well. All my services you have paid home. But that you have vouchsafed with your crowned brother and these your contracted heirs of your kingdoms, my poor house to visit, it is a surplus of your grace, which never my life may last to answer. Oh, Paulina, we honour you with trouble. But we came to see the statue of our queen. Your gallery have we passed through, not without much content in many singularities. But we saw not that which my daughter came to look upon, the statue of her mother. As she lived peerless, so her dead likeness, I do well believe, excels whatever yet you looked upon or hand of man hath done. Therefore I keep it lonely, apart. But here it is. 
Prepare to see the life as lively mocked as ever still sleep mocked death. Behold, and say it is well. Oh. I like your silence. It the more shows off your wonder. But yet speak, first you, my liege. Comes it not something near? Her natural posture. Chide me, dear stone, that I may say indeed thou art Hermione. Or rather thou art she in thy not chiding, for she was as tender as infancy and grace. But yet, Paulina, Hermione was not so much wrinkled, nothing so aged as this seems. Oh, not by much. So much the more our carver's excellence, which lets go by some sixteen years and makes her as she lived now. As now she might have done, so much to my good comfort as it is now piercing to my soul. Oh, thus she stood, even with such life of majesty, warm life, as now it coldly stands, when first I wooed her. I am ashamed. Does not the stone rebuke me for being more stone than it? Oh, royal peace, there's magic in thy majesty, which has my evils conjured to remembrance. And from thy admiring daughter took the spirits standing like stone with thee. And give me leave, and do not say it is superstition that I kneel and then implore her blessing. Lady, dear queen, that ended when I but began, give me that hand of yours to kiss. Oh, patience! The statue is but newly fixed, the colour's not dry. My lord, your sorrow was too sore laid on, which sixteen winters cannot blow away, so many summers dry. Scarce any joy did ever so long live, no sorrow, but killed itself much sooner. Dear my brother, let him that was the cause of this have power to take off so much grief from you as he will peace up in himself. Indeed, my lord, if I had thought the sight of my poor image would thus have wrought you, for the stone is mine, I'd not have showed it. Do not draw the curtain. No longer shall you gaze on it, lest your fancy may think anon it moves. Let be, let be. Would I were dead, but methinks already... What was he that did make it? See, my lord, would you not deem it breathed, and that those veins did verily bear blood? Masterly done. The very life seems warm upon her lip. The fixture of her eye has motion in it, as we are mocked with art. I'll draw the curtain. My lord's almost so far transported that he'll think anon it lives. Oh, sweet Paulina, make me to think so twenty years together. No settled senses of the world can match the pleasure of that madness. Let it alone. I am sorry, sir, I have thus far stirred you. But I could afflict you, Father. Do, Paulina, for this affliction has a taste as sweet as any cordial comfort. Still, methinks there is an air comes from her. What fine chisel could ever yet cut breath? Let no man mock me, for I will kiss her. Good my lord, forbear. The ruddiness upon her lip is wet. You'll mar it if you kiss it. Stain your own with oily painting. Shall I draw the curtain? No, not these twenty years. So long could I stand by a looker on. Either forbear, quit presently the chapel, or resolve you for more amazement. If you can behold it, I'll make the statue move indeed, descend and take you by the hand. But then you'll think, which I protest against, I am assisted by wicked powers. What you can make her do, I am content to look on. What's to speak, I am content to hear. For tis as easy to make her speak as move. It is required you do awake your faith. Then all stand still, or those that think it is unlawful business I am about, let them depart. Proceed. No foot shall stir. Music. Awake her. Strike. It is time. Descend. Be stone no more. Approach. Strike all that look upon with marvel. Come, I'll fill your grave up. Stir. Nay, come away, bequeath to death your numbness, for from him dear life redeems you. You perceive she stirs. Start not. Her actions shall be holy as you hear my spell is lawful. My liege... Do not shun her until you see her die again, for then you kill her double. 
Nay, present your hand. When she was young, you wooed her. Now, in age, is she become the suitor? Oh, she's warm. If this be magic, let it be an art lawful as eating. She embraces him. She hangs about his neck. If she pertain to life, let her speak too. Aye, and make it manifest where she has lived. Or how stolen from the dead. That she is living, where it but told you, should be hooted at like an old tale. But it appears she lives. Though yet she speak not. Mark a little while. Please you to interpose, fair madam. Kneel. And pray your mother's blessing. Turn, good lady. Our perdita is found. You gods look down. And from your sacred vials, pour your graces upon my daughter's head. <laughs> Tell me, mine own, where hast thou been preserved? Where lived? How find thy father's court? For thou shalt hear that I, knowing by Paulina that the oracle gave hope thou wast in being, have preserved myself to see the issue. There's time enough for that, lest they desire upon this push to trouble your joys with like relation. Go. Together, you precious winners all. Your exaltation partake to everyone. I, an old turtle, will wing me to some withered bough, and there my mate that's never to be found again lament till I am lost. Oh, peace, Paulina, thou shouldst a husband take by my consent as I by thine a wife. This is a match, and made between by vows. Thou hast found mine, but how is to be questioned? For I saw her, as I thought, dead, and have in vain said many a prayer upon her grave. <laughs> I'll not seek far, for him I partly know his mind, to find thee an honourable husband. Come, Camillo, <laughs> take her by the hand, whose worth and honesty is richly noted, and here justified by us a pair of kings. <laughs> Let's from this place. Queen, look upon my brother. Both your pardons, that e'er I put between your holy looks, my ill suspicion. This your son-in-law and son unto the king, whom heaven's directing is troth plight to your daughter. Good Paulina, lead us from hence, where we may leisurely each one demand and answer to his part, performed in this wide gap of time since first we were dissevered. Hastily. Lead away. <laughs> In The Winter's Tale by William Shakespeare, Leontes was played by Tom Courtney and Hermione Harriet Walter. Polixenes was Tim Pigott Smith. Paulina Jill Balkan and Autolycus, Nicholas Grace. Camillo was Hugh Dixon. Mamilius, Rory Campbell. The Clown, Chris Pavlo. The Shepherd, Sean Baker. Florizel, Jonathan Cullen. Perdita, Tracy Ann Oberman. Archidamus, Chris Scott. Emilia, Carolyn Jones. And Antigonus, Stephen Thorne. Dean was Johan Meredith. Cleomenes, Gerard McDermott. Dorcas, Alison Pettit and the Mariner Alex Lowe and other parts were played by members of the cast. The music was composed and arranged by Julie Cooper with Justin Pearson, cello, Alistair Malloy, percussion, Lucy Wakeford, harp, David Roach, oboe and the soprano soloist Claire Moore. The musical director was Julie Cooper. The Winter's Tale was directed by Owen O'Callaghan.